I can hold it against him. <laughs> I got the missing <laughs> Trump tape. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the P tape. I got the yeah. P tape. Yeah. Wait till that shit comes out, man. They should do it on pay per view, and they, they they pay off the deficit. That Trump P tape. <laughs> they could pay per view that shit. They could put it up in Madison Square Garden on the big screen and sell the place out. Three shows so on what a is Saturday. Tom, what is Tom Arnold looking for? Keep keep. I'm, re- I'm recording audio, but video they'll hear this. So you guys cool with this being out? Yeah. Okay. Go. Preston, let's do this it's shit. It's not like the president's vindictive. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll hold this against us. <laughs> Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happened Now is brought to you by Robinhood. Robinhood is an investment app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. They strive to make financial services work for everyone, not just the wealthy. Simple and intuitive. With a clear design, with data presented, in an easy to digest way. The reason why I'm telling you about this is because Robinhood is giving the church family free stock like Apple for the Sprint to help build your portfolio. When was the last time anybody talked to you about your portfolio? Uncle Joey's talking to you about the portfolio. Sign up at Robinhood.com church. That's church.robinhood.com. I'm sorry. Church.robinhood.com. And they're going to give you a free stock like Apple for the Sprint just to help you get started. All right. This is co- no commission fees. Other brokerages charge up to $10 for every t- trade. But Robinhood doesn't charge commission fees, trade stocks, and you keep all your profits. So do me a favor. Go to church.robinhood.com. The church is also brought to you by my motherfuckers, motherfuckers. Because listen, tis the season to make Gitas, Okay. Fuck being jolly. You need Guinness to be jolly. And that's when my bookie comes in. Remember who you're betting on is just as important as who you're betting with. And that's why I always tell all you fucking sickos to bet with my bookie. I love you motherfuckers. Now, trust me, guys. They're the best bet for you this season. They've been in business for years. They got great reviews online. And their mobile site is nice and easy to use. So do me a favor. Go to mybookie.com right now and deposit. After 7 p.m. Eastern time, and they'll give you an additional $25 free play on deposits over $100. Use promo code CHURCH to activate your offer. Take this fucking mule, Lee. Fucking tremendous. What up, Greg? How are we going to follow that? How are we going to follow that, Joey? What the fucking thing? Now, what is Tom Arnold looking for (laughs) with this fucking show? What is he looking for? I I haven't seen it. I just saw the commercial for it. He jumps on the desk. He's looking for a P-tape. Yeah. And all the missing tapes. Yeah, I thought he was looking for the N-word tape. That's what from from the Apprentice. From from the Apprentice, all that shit. What hurts him more? The the N-word tape getting out or the P-tape getting out? P-tape. None. (laughs) That's also true. You know, the other day we were talking about something. What we forget as a country is that we've hated every president the last. Since I came from Cuba, you motherfuckers been hating presidents. Yeah. All right? You hated Kennedy so much you shot the motherfucker. Then you impeach Nixon, whatever. I mean, it, I still remember the night he fucking was on TV. I was a kid, and I was crying. I really believed in America. How can a pre- I didn't understand Watergate. I didn't understand none of that shit. But we, we're always crying. We've never been happy. The only way we're happy is if somebody brings us. We want the president that every day we wake up and there's a check for $20 in the mailbox. <laughs> That's it. That's the only president we want. That yeah. Just puts a 20 in your mailbox every day. Unless it's that, we're always going to cry or complain about something. So you're trying to figure out, listen, dog, if you put the fucking tape on in here all day, if you just put down a tape recorder in here for a week, the things you hear. You mean before the podcast starts? Before the podcast. Yeah, the shit we talked about before. When me and Lee sit here at night, you could make millions listening to it. Yeah. But anybody that listens to it knows that whatever is said isn't really coming from the heart. First of all, you're dealing 50% with a comedian. 50% of our humor comes from comedy, which comes from pain. When I found my mother on the floor and her arm was purple, and I could see that her by the shoulder, it was just like you got hit with a train purple. She had a massive heart attack. I cracked a joke to myself. So why wouldn't I crack a joke about anything else? The most sacred thing in a, in a, in a man's life is his mother. And I'll never forget to diffuse that shock. I crack like a fucking joke. Yeah. 
like I cracked a joke to myself. Like she'll never know I got left back in the seventh grade. I knew it. Like just stupid shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I said, we got a thing sent to us from Reddit, like a thing. Oh, yeah. And the guy said that I made a joke about uh, a Mexican little boy crying in a cage. And then you should have seen like 15 people said, well, Joey forgets he's an immigrant. I never forgot I was an immigrant. Well, comedians, what we say is the first, the first, when you see something, Greg Fitzsimmons, that first voice, you know, your reaction, that's the reaction the audience wants to hear. Hmm. We just don't have the balls to say it. Right. I'll never forget 9-11. 9-11 was on a Tuesday morning, and Monday night I was at the store, and Paul Mooney was on stage, and it was the week that the black guy was going to break the home run record. Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds against the white dude. Mag um, Mark McGuire. And oh, was it Sammy Sosa? No, no, no. No, it was, it was, it was Sosa. Mark, it was later. It was Mark McGuire and the white dude going head to head. And I'm not, not forget that night he opened up with, they're never going to let that nigga break the record. <laughs> like, he just went off on a tangent. And he went off on it so deep that it actually went into my fucking subconscious, okay? Like, they're never going to let that nigga hit a home run. Never, that, that's never going to happen, homie. They're going to do something to make sure that nigga's whatever, you know, return. So the next morning, I wake up to my wife going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. My wife was really, like, I had just gotten with her. She was overly emotional. And I'm waking up from a cocaine fucking hangover. And I'm seeing the first tower go down. And I'll, I'll never forget laying back down and go, Mooney was right. <laughs> They're not going to let that nigga break the home run record. Because it was like on a Tuesday when he was going to do it. That was the first thought that came to my head. Yeah. Then the second thought was the Giants didn't cover last night. Uh -huh. The Giants did not cover the night before. And I go, that that's comedy. That's yeah. what you wanted to hear. Yeah, well, my dad died. We, they had a priest come by and say a few words, but he handed out a he handed out a uh, the the prayer on a piece of paper to everybody, like a little like a little missalette, because they know half the people aren't. You know, we're Irish Catholic, but there's there's some there's some of the uh, the other tribes snuck in, some of my dad's friends that were Jewish, so they gave him gave them all a cheat sheet, and we say the prayer, and then we're done. The priest goes. Okay, if you could hand those back into the front again, and I go, I go. He lived like he died like he lived, cheap, and uh, and everybody started laughing, and the priest got fucking pissed, and I was like, good, you should get pissed. Collecting that's, the fucking prayer that's back. That's the reaction. That's the reaction. Yeah. It's really weird that that's what comedy is. Comedy is your first, the first thing you really say to yourself. Yeah. That's the comedy. And then that thought, your uh, your smooth side, whatever that part of your brain comes in and smooths out the joke, and you say yeah. you, you talk yourself out of doing the joke yeah. on stage that night. But that first thing that comes to your mind, that's the joke they want to hear. Yeah, that takes you a long time because you don't have the balls to say it. But that's the truth. He kept saying that nigga ain't gonna hit the home run. They're <laughs> never gonna let him hit the home run. And as soon as that building got hit with the first plane. That's all I kept thinking about was he was fucking right. Because it was that night when he was going to do it, that Tuesday night. Yeah. What? Dude, I, I was on stage last Thursday night, and uh, I, I did this joke. I just stupid new joke. It wasn't like anything I thought much about. It's probably not a joke I would have kept, but I just threw it out there because I had a piece of paper with new bits written on it, and it was Thursday night. There was fucking 12 people there. Where was this? At the improv. And so I go... Uh, and the joke was just, you know, my nephew's complaining he can't get any pussy at college. You know, I said, well, don't worry about it. I go, I go, this thing called the freshman 15. I go, you find all those girls in the spring. You're good to go. And this, girl, this woman stands up, middle-aged woman, fuck you! Fuck you with that fat-shaming, misogynist shit! But I mean, Joey, she went zero to 60. She didn't, she didn't ramp up. It, the second I'd finished that joke, she was on her feet screaming the whole crowd turns around and looks at her like what the fuck is this a terrorist attack and the bouncers come over and i'm throwing gas on the fire because she's with her two daughters and i'm going look at mommy getting thrown out the club. <laughs> i go that i go that's how you burn calories getting that angry and they drag her out screaming and i have to fin i gotta do another 10 minutes and the whole room is fucking awkward at this point so i i joke about it. i'm getting big laughs but then i still gotta eventually go back to my material and so I come out front, 
and I'm standing there talking to uh, Owen Smith and a couple other people. And um, all of a sudden, the woman comes out again, full head of steam again. Fuck you. You fucking, you're not funny. I would never fuck you. Like, <laughs> I go, what are you talking about? And so I'm standing there and, I, and I'm going back and forth with her until I realize she's not de-escalating. Like her pitch is staying at 10 and I'm not going to stand on Melrose in front of the improv screen with this crazy lady for any longer. So I turn around, I walk away down the street to go to my car, but she's screaming at the back of my head and I feel like a bitch. Like I'm walking away from her and all the comics are watching. I'm not even turning around. I'm just beelining back to my car. And so same thing, I, I uh, the next day, it got tagged on some social media of mine, and and she wrote this fucking letter. The daughter wrote this letter, saying that I I was a misogynist when I said about her mom and blah blah blah, and blew it all up. And then of course all the comments are like, I would have kicked his ass and <laughs> all this shit. Like nobody, they weren't there. They they're hearing a crazy, and so uh, yes, yeah, so it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. What do you think of this thing that's going on right now? Well, that I could come out after thirty six years. And say that you choked me at a party or you showed me a dick. What the, where are we going with this? Mm. Where are we, this is what I was scared of. This is the first time that I, I've, I, okay, so now it's not about what we did two years ago or that I showed you my dick in a room or nothing like that. Now it's something that happened. So for 36 years while I was a judge, you didn't say nothing. And there's already women fucking saying no. Like, they don't even know the whole fuck. Nobody knows the whole story. Nobody was there. Well, I, that, I think that's the scary part is that just because of the way things are now is that not that they, they can't say it, but it, it, it everyone immediately goes guilty and you can't really recover from that. So, like, I, I don't have as much of a problem with them coming out if he did it, if they didn't do it. Like, I think there should be a punishment if they didn't do it and have some repercussions for that. But if he did it, I don't have much of a problem with that, but I just, it's scary to think about like someone could just say anything online and if you get enough people behind you, no no matter what the truth is, people are always going to, like I just saw uh, one comic is going to be in Boston, it's pretty coming up and they said, uh, coming back after assault allegations, even though it came out that he didn't, like it, oh, yeah, he never did it. I was like, about. that's crazy. Well, here's the problem is that when there's a movement, there's momentum and people get swept up into it. And that can be used for good, that can be used for bad. In this case, obviously, it's for good. You know, this movement is trying to uh, help women see that they w they should be believed when they come out, that we have to not marginalize them right away. But then people get swept up in that, and they suddenly go, oh, this is part of that, as opposed to, let's judge each case on its own. Let's not say, Oh, I'm already riled up because, you know, there's been all these cases that have been proven about men abusing women. So I'm already angry. And now let's grab this guy and put him in that that same energy as opposed to let's look at this one individual case and try to judge it by those merits. This morning I spoke to a friend of mine, Joe Lucci. And I met Joe Lucci probably in the eighth grade and the, the band... The area where he lived was the wildest area in my hometown. There's five or six grammar schools. That grammar school by far takes everybody away. Like they were doing shit in the eighth grade that nobody was doing in the town. And everybody had to catch up over the years. Like they were the real deal. They had the field. They didn't just have Lincoln School, but they had the field and they had the rocks. And the rock, they were on the rocks every night, these guys, which meant they were out there drinking, smoking, fucking ghetto blasters with music. They were crazy. You go down there at 4 in the morning and find people. Like, if we lived downtown, we'd go, let's cut through 64th Street Field. You'd find eight motherfuckers tripping on acid. I mean, they, they were just deep. And uh, he goes, I'm coming to the show to see you in West Palm Beach, and I'm bringing my wife. He goes, should I bring my daughters? What do you think? And I go, uh, no. I go, Unless you want them to know that I OD'd in your backyard. And me and him started howling. I went to his party. Like I, went, I was a junior in high school, and I went to his party like at 6 o'clock at night. His party was started like at 4 in the afternoon. And I got there like at 6 with a gram of blow. I was in high school in Quaaludes. But there were the 
counter quaaludes. That's when I started eating the ones that people were making at home. Yeah. Which the table are crooked. Right. Which means that the the, the, the thing leaks <laughs> into the bottom ones and these yeah. stay weak. Yeah. So I ate one of the weak ones first and then I ate the second one. And all I remember is waking up in an alley at four in the morning with drool and puke all over me and the next day hearing the stories. Yeah. Uh, how are high school kids allowed to be drinking? I mean, obviously, anyways, but at 4 p.m.? Like, his, when I did that, we tried to hide it. His parents owned the bar. Oh, my God. Oh, was that a bar? His parents owned the bar. So they, was always, they were always at the bar. Yeah. So he would have parties in his basement that were just legendary. But his legendary parties were, were before concerts. So I still remember going to his house. You ready for this, Joe Luch? August... 4th of 1979, they would start at 4. You'd get there, there'd be a keg of beer, and there'd be 12 guys and 12 girls or 20 girls or whatever the fuck, and people were smoking, snorting blow, eating pills. And then at about 6.45, we'd walk to Kennedy Boulevard, take the bus into the city, and walk to Madison Square Garden. Fucked up. Fucked up. And go watch. We went to see ACDC and Ted. And he said all that. He goes, that was a rough one. He goes, I remember just Angus running through the audience with, on top of uh, whatever's. But then he, we all have the same trait. He goes, I started doing that tradition way before anybody, before a concert. Like meet at my house at three. He goes, the first party I had was Monday, December 6, 1976. And he's my age. So he had to be fucking dirt. He was ten, not ten, thirteen, and he goes. I went to see Black Ted Nugent open up for Black Sabbath when he released Free for All tour, and he goes. Guess what else happened that night? The Cleveland Browns beat the whatever in Monday Night Football. I mean, that's how good his memory yeah. was. Yeah. But I was just thinking about how could you judge me from that night? Well, you can't judge somebody from what they did thirty years ago, or I'd be under the prison. Yeah, but drugs is different than uh, holding down a woman against her will, trying to take her clothes off. You know, that stays with her. That thing, her memory of that night is going to be a lot more clear because for a woman to be attacked like that is traumatic. And it stays with them and it fucks, it fucks up now, their head. Now, why wouldn't a woman wake up the next morning and contact the authorities or contact somebody? Well, because there's or a hold it in for 30 years. I mean, the whole thing about holding it in that long is uh, it's a mystery to a lot of people. But I think the reality of coming out as a teenage girl at a time when you, you're, you're embarrassed, you got a zit. You're trying to cover that zit on the way to school. You don't want to be noticed. You don't want to be the center of attention. And you're, and you're raised to respect people that are older than you, so you take shit for granted if it's an older person. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why a, a girl that age doesn't want freshman year of college. I, I came home for, to the dorms, my fir, it was my first week in school, and I came home and we were we were snorting crank because that's what this kid from Philly came to school with. I'd never I'd never heard of crank in my life, so we <laughs> snort crank and drink a tequila, and then we go out to these parties, and we come back to the dorm, and now it's like two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. And I see this girl, and she's walking up the steps of the dorm, and she's got her arms around two friends, and she's crying hysterically. And I go, what the fuck happened? And they said, well, she just got sexually assaulted by this guy. I go, well, where is he? They said he took off. He's, you know, he's wearing a, a, a Bell, Bellevue Middle School hoodie sweatshirt. I don't remember what it said, but it was something really specific. So I'm standing there with this other kid, Jeff, and I didn't know Jeff. I'd never met him before. We went on to become close friends, still still friends with him to this day. I met him that night. And uh, and so they described his sweatshirt, and we go to Com Ave. Basically, BU's campus is built on one avenue. It's not round. It's a straight line. So we get to Com Ave, and we're in the middle of it. So I go, all right, I'll go up. You go down. Let's find this guy. So I run up. And sure enough, I'm, you know, I'm five foot eight, 150 pounds. Of course, I come on the guy and the guy's a football player and he's with a buddy who's a football player, but he's got the sweatshirt on. And I said, hey, they want to talk to you back at sleeper dorm. And uh, and we have a couple words and his his friend comes over and he knocks me down and then they take off. Just, you know, cocky. So not at a sprint, just a jog away from me. And I'm on the ground. I find a very fine fruit punch bottle and I smash it in half 
and I chase these guys up the street and they cut into Hamilton House, which was a dorm about two blocks away. And they go in, but the dorm, the security guard, there's like a, there's a, uh, um, there's a lobby and to get through the door, which is bulletproof glass, that guy's got to buzz you in. So he's about to buzz him in. I come running in with the bottle. I go, these guys are wanted on the other campus for rape. So the guy doesn't buzz him in. Two guys turn on me. They come at me. I hold up the bottle. I say, I say to the guy, call the cops. He calls the cops. For It takes about four minutes. And I got these two football players and I got a bottle. And I got them. And the cops show up. And they, they take statements from everybody. And everybody goes home. And I got I get a call from the head of the dorms about four days later saying that this this these guys are pressing charges on me for assault with a deadly weapon. And that the girl who got assaulted, she's not pressing charges. Cause she it's her freshman year, it's the first week of school. She's been she's been taking SAT prep courses, taking AP classes in high school, all leading up to this experience. College is her first week. And she decides, I don't want to spend my freshman year in a courtroom. I don't want to get taken apart by the prosecution. I don't want to, you know, whatever. And she wasn't raped like penetration, but she was assaulted. Which means? I, I don't know. Could mean could mean a lot of different things. But, I mean, she wasn't penetrated. So, not that that means anything. But she's the reason I say that is because I was thinking about a rape kit, and there wouldn't have been a rape kit in this case. So she didn't have to under, undergo that. So I say to her, look, you got to you got to press charges on these guys. So we, we did that. She leveraged it. She goes, well, if they don't dra- if they don't drop the charges on Greg, I'm pressing charges on on that guy for assault. So it all came out in the wash. They dropped the charges. She dropped the charges. We went on. But it made me think at that time, you don't put yourself in the reality of a woman is up against when she's got to press charges. And what what else is going on in her life that would give her the flexibility and the strength and the independence from everything else in her life to be able to follow that that track. And it might not have been a time for, for her at the time that this happened. She's at Yale. You know, this other girl, she was a Puerto Rican girl at Yale. That was, what, half of 1% of the population? She was low income. She was there on scholarships. She already felt like she didn't fit in. Everybody else at Yale is wearing fucking corduroy blazers with leather patches on the elbows and pipes. And here she is, this Puerto Rican girl probably wearing Sassoon jeans and a halter top. She doesn't know how to fit in. And now she's going to press charges on a guy who's Kavanaugh. This guy who's a made man. His father went here. His grandfather went here. You know, so she sat on it. um, This is a reality on college campuses. Right. Because I used to hear about little things in Boulder that would like, I wasn't a private investigator, but I would just hear things. Yeah. You know, you just heard little things that, this uh, fraternity was kind of crooked or whatever, you know, and girls pass out and they run trains by them and shit right, like that. Right, right. That was never really my thing. I didn't understand that whole thing. Yeah. There was a girl in my hometown that they called Marathon Woman. There was this, <laughs> family, there was this family, the Denny's. The Denny's were a fucked up family, but thank God for them, I got my license a year earlier. I got my driver's license when I was 16. Because, you used one of their IDs? No, because their uncle owned the driving school. Okay. So for like 50 bucks, you get a license no matter how old you are. <laughs> if you had a mustache and looked 17, you got a license. But the one of them was a guitar player. And he acted, he did everything like Jimmy Page. And he got some fucking groupie chick. And you'd roll up, roll up on him. And he wasn't a bad kid. He was yeah. shaking your hand. Hey, what's up? You know, he was one of the few kids in the early 70s that had long hair in my neighborhood. Yeah. And he would ask you, you want to get your dick sucked? <laughs> She'll suck your dick. And I was like scared of all that stuff at that age. So I just avoided. How Jim. old were you? I had to be 14 yeah. or 15. When I first met Jimmy, I had to be maybe 12. But as yeah. I got older, I started hanging out with Jimmy's brother. When my mother died, I started hanging out with Jimmy's brother, who people would pull me aside and go, why are you hanging out with the devil? Yeah. And I liked him because he was the devil. But after a year, I couldn't hang out with him no more because he double-crossed you on every deal. Yeah. You always got double-crossed. He was just a bag of lies. But it was an experience. But his brother, 
would take that chick to like a house party and go, everybody want their dick sucked? And everybody would go, yeah. And she'd go in the room and he would send guys in one by one. Nobody paid a dollar. Why'd she do it? She just liked it. She just liked it. There's a thousand different variants. She, one night she blew 18 guys, and the other night she blew 21. She did that thing twice and would go to high school the next day. Jesus. And she would sit in the middle of the class, and the guys in the back would go, Marathon woman, Marathon woman, and she wouldn't turn around. It was, and even now, thinking back, I still remember what her face looked like, and you could tell there was something not right with her. Sadness. There was something, no, 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 there was something not right with her. Like, she was a half of uh, uh, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something wasn't right with Jesus, her. Jesus, that's, you know? that's a sad story. And, and I, she graduated, because she was a year older than me. And I remember she, I was like a junior when she went off. I was a sophomore. My mother, yeah, my mother died sophomore year. I was a sophomore when the rumors of her started coming up. And then one day we went to school, and it was everywhere. Yeah. Like she had blown 18 guys and came out and burped. <laughs> she said, who's next? You know what I'm saying? Like that type of shit. Jesus. And I spoke to somebody recently and they asked me, do you, do you remember that night? And I go, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I heard about it both times that she went off. I was at a party somewhere else uptown. Both times was downtown. Because Mike Denny lived downtown and we're a downtown family. But I can't imagine. Well, this girl who uh, Kavanaugh and his buddies had all, they'd all tagged in their yearbook. There was some, what was her name? Uh, Prater alumni, it was, it was a first name. Let me yeah, Prate, was it? Uh, anyway, it rhymed with eight because they had a little rhyme about if you can't get a date, it's never too late, call up Prate. Was it Prate? Something like that. Let me look. And... Uh, and so, so they they all had in their yearbook. There was something like fifteen guys that all had her name in their yearbook quotes as like a conquest. Renate, R E N A T. Renate. And uh, and here's this woman. She's what is she in her fifties? How old is Kavanaugh? Fifty something. Yeah. She's in her fifties. She's living in suburban Connecticut. She's got two and a half kids, a Volvo, <laughs> and all of a sudden this is coming out in the national papers that she was the woman to to conquer in high school 30 years before she was one of the women who supported him uh, not joey kavanaugh yeah, and and, said, and was like signed the letter like oh he yeah. was he tr always treated me with respect yeah right and then, and then the yearbook comes out yeah do you i mean greg you have older kids do you feel like with can you blame porn how crazy it's gone like that kids know more stuff now or did you guys know just as much when you were growing up? Oh, just shit. I didn't know shit. I knew just as much. Oh, I didn't know shit. I had a couple magazines. And uh, I remember the first time I saw a porn movie, I was at my buddy, uh, my my Colombian buddy, David Aranguren. Him and his brother, Hector, they lived above a, a bodega on Cortland Street in New York. New York had projects. Or Tarrytown, where I grew up, had projects downtown because we had a GM plant. And it was a big Cuban, Colombian, black neighborhood downtown and he lived in the middle of it it was it was actually really fucking it was dangerous we used to get robbed all the time and so we're sitting in his apartment and hector comes in and me and david are maybe maybe 13 12 probably more like 12 and hector's like he's already like 18 and he's already he's already done some time for uh for cocaine bringing cocaine in from miami and so he shows us a porno movie on a reel to reel. That's what that's what the original. Yeah. You know what year was this? Eighty one. Yeah, reel to reel. And so we're sitting there watching it, and uh, I got a chubby, and he starts laughing. He starts grabbing it. He's grabbing my dick, Jesus. and I'm watching these two women go down on each other with the muffs, more hair than fucking oh, yeah. you have, Joey, on your head. Yeah, it's hilarious. You're going at it and noise, but you jazz band, little some good funk, not that shitty. Back in the back in the seventies, late seventies, eighties, they had as Rufus a good, and shit, yeah, know, play the guitar, yeah. right, right, and uh, he kept grabbing my dick, and I was like, but you know, what? I didn't think it was gay or weird or anything. <laughs> I thought it was one of those like you ever have an experience that just sort of gets bottled up in your brain, and you don't open that bottle again for like twenty or thirty years, and then you open it up and you go, oh, oh, that was fucked up. 
That was wrong what he was doing. He showed me that porn for a reason. Now, let me ask you this. Would you, if he was running for governor today, yeah. would you call up Rain and fucking Pharaoh and say, guess what? One day he showed me a porn and he touched my dick when my dick got up. No, because I didn't feel victimized by it. And it didn't scar me. There was no trauma. Did you look at it as a joke? Like, I got pulled over. When I, I, I got in a guy's car one day and he went to touch. He asked me if I liked basketball. I had the basketball between my legs. Yeah. And he hit the ball and he grabbed my dick. Yeah. And at the next light, the fucking door opened by itself. God. God had just showed me, like, what I had gotten myself into. Now he was going to get me out of it, but don't ever do it again. And I ran away and I got the guy's license plate number. And the next day I told a few of my friends that if we saw that license plate, we were going to fuck him up. Yeah. But that. But that's the point. You had the power to do that. Even though in that moment you were disempowered. You still had your boys, and you still there would have been retribution on your end that would have been satisfying. But for a, a teenage girl, it is the system's not in her favor, you know. And so, and I think with this guy, I didn't feel I didn't feel that violated because a I didn't attach any sexuality to it on his end. I just thought he was fucking around, and maybe he was. But looking back on it, the odds are showing a twelve-year-old a porn movie and grabbing his, grabbing uh, his chubby. How old was he? He was like eighteen, maybe nineteen. Yeah. So, it, but but it's different. I think I don't know. I don't know. I think it's I more scarring when I you're. I was introduced to. Right now, I can say a thousand bad things, which are, are honest. I loved my godfather. My godfather is one of the best Catholic godfathers you could ever have. Uh, when you're Catholic and you're Cuban, when somebody baptizes you, it's not how white people act. Like, you don't see those people again. Yeah. The Cubans hold that very sacred. Right. They, they come to the house every week and they talk to you. And I still remember my godmother. And him and her had a divorce and I had a pick. I had a pick. I was forced to pick a side. And my godfather used to throw me 50s. <laughs> he used to take me to the movies. But one of the things he did was he would take me to his, like, girlfriend's houses. And he would uh, not fuck him in front of me. But I remember when I was like eight one time, we went over there and he goes, I want to show you something. And there was two chicks eating each other out. When you're eight, you, you, you're like traumatized. <laughs> and then every time he would see me, he would say something sexual to me. Like, yeah. are you, do you still piss sweet in Spanish? That means, are you, are you coming yet? Like, yeah. Like he would just say little things to me to prep me for women. Uh -huh. So by the time I was 11 or 12, I was already prepped. Yeah. But I was so indoctrinated, so indoctrinated in the Catholic religion that it was against everything I had, like to take my dick out or touch a girl's teeth. So you had shame about it even I though had, you were ready to go. Yeah, I was a prude. I was always, yeah. always a prude. Like I talk a lot of shit. I didn't get my first blowjob till late. Because I thought if a woman sucked a dick, she was just disgusting. Like at that age, it was disgusting. But there was an incident. There was an incident when I was about in the seventh grade or eighth grade. There was an incident one night where my high school teachers played the Mets. My the, the faculty from North Bergen played against the Mets in a celebrity charity basketball game <clears throat> and the place was packed and I was with the kids from downtown Martin Perez these this other group of kids Peter Jimenez Julian he was dead now all these guys and on the way out there was a girl I mean there was it was a school auditorium you know and it was emptying out and there was a girl and everybody was grabbing the tits like at one point she was like covered up and people were just like grabbing the tits or grabbing her ass. And she was like turning around. And I even think I grabbed the tit too. And I was really young. I remember that I got really, like my dick got hard and my face got red. And I remember that it started off as a joke with this girl. Like they were saying she was giving free squeezes or something. But then it was like 300 guys were on top of her. Like it was really ugly. We walked home. And I always thought about how bad that girl felt. Mm. Like, I, she was older than us. If we were in the seventh grade, maybe she was in high school. Yeah. You know, I saw her years later, and she was still crazy. And by that time, she had fucked 50 guys. So yeah. she had no credibility if she would have attacked anybody. But that was wrong. 
that was wrong thinking back now 50 years later that that, that, that was wrong that night you know but who the fuck's no who the fuck knows what they're doing like Cosby got three years today. Yeah. Three to, three ten, to ten, yeah. Three to ten. That means that means so a year and a half. That's a year and a half. Good behavior. That's a year and a half and he's got a tons of money. Yeah. And he's gonna claim that he's sick so he put you in the hospital. It's really not in jail. Fuck. And then you get special privileges and he gets a TV. He's never gonna t- what he did in my world is just fucking terrible. Sixty women and, and came after him. And that's just what those that's are just the ones that came forward. That's just the ones that came forward. Triple that. There's triple that uh, that said, you know what? We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to yeah. open up this wound. Yeah. You know, they could go into somebody's house and waking up on the couch and go, what happened? Ah, oh, we were fucking around. We ate a star. You know, like we just ate an edible. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Which did happen to you a couple times. But <laughs> to men. To, it happened to men. We just left George Perez on the couch. We just left him on the couch. Sarah Tiana, I helped her over to the couch and put it down, put a blanket on her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Owen Benjamin just never came back. He yeah. just got up, walked out. Next thing you know, he walked to Vermont. <laughs> and the next thing you know, he was getting chased out of Vermont. Now he's off of Twitter. Him and Alex Jones are starting a web page together and shit. He did, get, did he get thrown off Twitter? A while ago. Yeah, he could before Alex Jones. I, me- I remember watching his videos and they were, they were fucking, they were bent. He was he was losing his mind. He gets mad when people say stuff like that. Apparently, oh yeah. I mean, who knows? Maybe I I don't think it's fake, but it's. You it, think it, he believes all that stuff? I don't know. It seems like it. Who? What does he believe? He's super right wing. There's a lot of like alt right kind of stuff, you know, conspiratorial shit, and uh, just. But. I don't know. I don't want to speak. I shouldn't speak about it. I, I opened my mouth before I should have. Because, cause you know, he's a friend. I haven't he's seen a nice him in guy. a while. No, he's, he's a, a very nice guy. guy. I'm not saying he's nothing not yeah. bad. We're talking about edibles now. Yeah. He was fine. So he came in here one day. <laughs> he ate one of those red stars. I saw him, like, stretching his neck and shit. Yeah. Like he was doing something weird. And all of a sudden he goes, do you mind if I take a walk? And that's it. Yeah. Like, he never came back. Right. And we spoke briefly the next day. He's like, man, I just started walking. And then next thing you know, a week later, he's moving to Vermont. Like yeah, that, right. That star changed his whole world. Mm-hmm. Like it, it put him through changes. Well, your whole week, we were just talking before the podcast about how Greg's producer, who produces XM Radio, is a good producer and forgot to press record once because you gave him some. I don't even know what you gave him. But gummies. Gummy, gummy bears. Gummies. Yeah, it was gummy yeah. bears. It was like... Uh... It was like Mardi Gras. You were throwing those gummy bears around like like we were a bunch of fucking frat guys. It's but every time no chiba chews, chiba chews, oh boy, that's what it was. But those edibles, all even acid. That's one thing I stick up for, like acid. Really? Chiba chew. Let me tell you something, man. And I'm gonna tell you this, and you could say whatever you want or whatever. Number one, I would have been dead right now if I would have done acid after my mom died. When it was real acid, when people were getting real acid, it opened up your mind. It really did, as dumb as this fucking sounds. But smoking marijuana opens up your mind. If you smoke marijuana, if, like, if you don't smoke marijuana, like Lee, for example, <laughs> and you started smoking in the morning, yeah. putting an iPad on, a, 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 whatever, iPod? Speak, speakers or music, and you went for a walk, you'd be surprised at the thoughts that come into your head. That's why I always enjoyed marijuana. I enjoyed marijuana from the beginning because now I had somebody to answer my questions. <laughs> the truth. The truth. I think in some ways marijuana, it's not necessarily that it gives you the thoughts, is it quiets all the other thoughts. So you can hear the one that was down there in the first place. That's what I loved about I loved like that's why I don't even drink when I smoke pot. I always just settled on reefer. Because I didn't like the effect alcohol added to it. Alcohol added the yelling and screaming effect to it. I don't like that. I just want to smoke a joint and put it on out. Yeah. Don't ask me no question that has no meaning to it. Because I really don't <laughs> give a fuck. I'd much rather listen to the album. What's the last time you put on an album and just sat transfixed? What album was it? It had to be about three weeks ago. I came in here one night. I was home all week. Like, we did the podcast in two nights, and I didn't have a spot for, like, three nights. And I came in here, and it had to be 10 o'clock. I knew Lee was at the fourth wall, and he wasn't going to stop by. 
and I put on for the first time. Okay, we listened to parts of it on the radio, but for the first time, I listened to both sides, back to back, smoking pot in the air, and it fucking destroyed me. Uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. My first CD. Yeah, like just listening to the whole album, both sides, made me realize I got to up my comedy game. Yeah. <laughs> because this was the fourth of five masterpieces in a row. That's never been done. Before. Did they have five five albums that good? Yeah, I think it's Metal, Wish You Were Here. Animals. Animals, Dark Side of the Moon, and, and it ended with The Wall. And the Wall, right. The original liner. Yeah, that is that is five So five even if I remove albums. Metal, and I put Wish You Were Here, Animals, Dark Side of the Moon, Wall, and... The, and it ends with the wall. Dark Side of the Moon ends with the wall. That's four world class. Specials. Yeah, those are yeah. four specials that even you got up in the living room and gave him a standing ovation yeah. on Netflix or whatever the fuck your platform is coming. They have fifteen studio albums. Yeah, did they really? Crazy. Damn. Yeah, and the electronics that were going on in the wall, all kinds of like precursors for the music we're listening to today. Well, the music we're listening to today is lacking a lot of things. I think it's it's more costumey yeah. than music. Did you see that thing yesterday? Ace Freely will be your best man for six thousand dollars <laughs> at a chapel in Vegas. If you is get it a married. reality show or for no, real? From October twenty sixth to the twenty eighth, <laughs> if you get married a kiss in Vegas. For six grand, he'll either marry you, walk her down the aisle, or be your best man. And then sing two songs for you. Like that. <laughs> I was thinking of splitting it with somebody and getting like a gay marriage and having Ace Freely be my fucking. How funny would that be? Marrying Eddie Bravo in gay church. Right, right. In with, full makeup. With full makeup, kiss makeup. No, no, no. He's He looks like a bus hit him. Yeah. You know, people think that. I, I really believe that if you're doing drugs at your 60s, keep going. Yeah. Don't stop. Over Like, I stopped at 44. But if you're over 50. Once you stop doing drugs, you're going to look worse. Yeah. You're going to look worse. Just keep going. Right. Just, he looks fucking like a bus hitter, but I love to that. <laughs> I think he's one of the funniest people on this planet. Yeah. Ace Freely. Yeah. One-on-one, -on -one, when he's high and shit on interviews, I fucking laugh my... He's from the Bronx. Yeah. So he's got that little accent, and he's mm -hmm. got that attitude. I crack up all the time. I watched an interview today with him that he was dead for the first two minutes of it. Because I know he was sitting there going, what the fuck am I doing yeah. in my life? Yeah. I got this fucking kid asking me about yeah. too hot to handle and mm -hmm. kiss alive and all this shit. <sighs> but for six grand, he'll be your best man. Shit. I'd do it. I'd, I'd be someone's best man for six grand. That's exactly the number, as a matter of fact. No less, no more. Yeah, but then you got to put up with the wedding and hang out. No. I'll be your best man if you pay me six grand. I walk in, walk you. Hug you, take a picture, and leave. I'll yeah. be your best man. Oh yeah. Six grand. Oh no, there's no reception. The wedding, I got that. That that that. that oh, that's twenty. It's your cost. It's twenty. Yeah. Twenty five. Hanging, hanging out and getting up on stage. Yeah. That's You're fifty. You going into the fifty thousand dollars zone? <laughs> I'm hitting you heavy. Five minutes, fifty thousand. <laughs> and I hang out at your wedding. I fucking hate yeah. weddings. Yeah. Oh my god. Like I yeah. fucking hate weddings. Hey, do you remember in your twenties loving weddings? No. I do. No. 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 Number one, I'm Cuban. Yeah. And Spanish people have a thing called quinceañeras. Yeah, they go from okay. 8 in the morning till fucking midnight. I know, and they have to do it when you're 15 yeah. or 16. And I was one of the only Cubans ever that I knew that went to a fucking quinceañera. I signed up. The girl asked me to be one of the guys with the tuxedo and the whole thing. And I fucking went there, and an hour in, I faked that I was sick. Yeah. I left and I never went to a King Signetta or anything again. And my mom's friends would beg me. My mom would beg me. And I'd tell her not in a million fucking years. Yeah. And then my stepdad had a daughter. And I went to her wedding when I was a kid. I was a kid. I didn't know what a wedding was about. I had an okay time. But that shit wedding where you have to take a plane for somebody. Oh, yeah. That's where it ends. Then you show I up did, and they got a table number. You don't even get to choose who you sit with. I did with? that one time. 
I, I made that mistake in 1987. I went back for a wedding in Jersey. You know, it cost me fucking eight, nine hundred dollars. I didn't have. Yeah. Right off the bat, you're like, what the fuck am I doing? I could just put a hundred in the envelope and live my fucking life. I actually went back there and I hated the whole experience. Like now weddings to me have become annoying. Like yeah. It's, it's annoying. Yeah. And the more bourgeois it is, the more annoying it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah, because nobody relaxes. Yeah, nobody relaxes. Yeah. The more bourgeois But the worst is, though is you buy that plane ticket, you buy that hotel room, you you put the money in the envelope. And then they sit, then they give you a nut. I'm 32. All right, I'm at table 32. You sit there and you got the second cousin of the of the bride. You don't know the bride. Now you're sitting with her second cousin. Your friends are all sitting on the other side of the room. They got the good table. You got the shit one. So for all this money, I can't even have the freedom to talk to who I want to talk to at this fucking reception? That's crazy. So I don't know. I like the I like weddings that are just uh just parties. The wedding I went to in Jersey, if there was 100 people at the wedding, 84 of them were doing blow at the reception. Yeah. So the cake, nobody was touching the cake. <laughs> nobody even thought of eating the meal. Everybody still had fucking roast beef and half a chicken on their table. Thought everybody was sweating. Everybody had their tie off. <laughs> that I dance had, floor was fucking I had, jacked. I had, I had never seen nothing like that in my yeah. life. There was a line at the bathroom. All the conversations were in the bathroom. That was the wedding of 87. I remember sitting there going, how fucking embarrassing is this? And the families, like the old people were sitting like, why are they all in the bathroom? Yeah. Everybody. I remember going into the bathroom and there was a thousand drinks with straws in them. Like everywhere in the men's bathroom. Toilets yeah. because guys yeah. are just going in there snorting <laughs> and leaving their drinks in there. Are they still married? Uh, no, they got yeah. they're long Shock. gone. Oh my God, they got divorced <laughs> ten years later. They're long gone. But that's the wedding where I found out Whitney Houston did coke. <laughs> she was there. No, the guy that got married on the car wash. Yeah, and he told me that Whitney Houston would come in, and when they would sweep the back of a car, it would be empty bindles. Yeah, like she would take bindles and throw them in the back seat. And I'm like, not only is this a bad wedding, but these guys are lying to me. Yeah. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Like that Whitney Houston doesn't do cocaine. No. And look, look right, at the fucking right, story. Right. Yeah. And I'll tell you who else had a badass wedding. You know who else had a badass wedding? Who? The first time I got married was one of the fucking craziest things. Because I got out of prison. I got out of prison in February. And I knocked her up in April. And I mean, I was snorting. I was doing everything with three hands. It's like nothing had happened. And I'm in the halfway house. So my goal was to get out of the halfway house. So we set the wedding for 9-9 of 89. That was the wedding date. The anniversary just fell a couple of days ago. We would have been married, I don't know, 20-something years. 29 years, yeah. We would have been married. And she, the whole family on her side was in that I was clean and sober. That I had changed my life. And I, <laughs> and I had a weekend pass from the judge. So they couldn't piss me till Wednesday legally. So I knew I was going to go fucking a wall off the reservation. <laughs> so we get to the church. My brother's flying, and he's going to be the best man. But he had gone to a wedding the night before. He went to a wedding the night before and got on a red eye and came to Colorado. And when he walked in, I had a couple of my friends come in. When he walked in, the priest pulled me aside. The priest goes, I don't know if you know what I did before I was here. I worked with drug addicts in San Francisco. Your best man. That's not going to work today. He's got rings around his nose from the night before. <laughs> That's how fucked up he was. So another friend of mine, Georgie, had to step in and be my best man. But Mike was in the back fucking habit. Yeah. He was the guy that would sue everybody. I had a friend that would <laughs> went on a suing spree. He, he teamed up with this Jew lawyer, and they were just <laughs> suing people. One after the other. He got tons of money. He got one because he was carrying a tub up a... A thing and the tub got cut. He got one stitch. The guy got him 200 large. Yeah. This Jew was a fucking savage. He got him another one and then he got his wife one because she was walking down the street with groceries and a kid was on a bicycle on the, on the street. She was on the sidewalk. This is how good this Jew was as an attorney. And a car cut the bike off. The bike went into the sidewalk and hit my friend's 
and she fell down, nothing happened. He got her like eighty thousand <laughs> because she sued the property owner for not having a fence. I mean, yeah. this Jew is just notorious. Yeah. yeah. So Mike, I remember Mike at the wedding being coked down. He's like, I got eight thousand in my pocket, and I got about four working. You know what I'm saying? That means he had four lawsuits working. They were suing people. He was getting commissions. The guy's name was Cozy, C O Z Z I. I'll never forget that. They're like, you need money? Go see Cozy. <laughs> like Cozy would sue you. Like you just go see him, and then he'll come up yeah, with a case for you. Yeah, come up with an idea. Yeah, yeah, come up with something. Did you fall on the last? It's a pitch year? meeting. Yeah. yeah, it was like he was tremendous. But I'll never forget he was loaded. Mike was loaded at the time. We get married at Saint Sacred Heart Church, and now we got to go to this courtyard Marriott for the reception. But Nebraska's playing Colorado that day. One of those big games. And my buddy's a degenerate gambler. So as soon as we get to the reception, he goes right up to my wife's family. He's like, where's the TV? And they're like, TV? There's no TVs here. These guys, he brought like three of his friends. My other buddy brought like two of his friends. They probably had an ounce and a half of blow between them. We were in the bathroom with my wife's brother. She had two brothers, but one of the brothers, Joe King, was crazy. We were in there. It was like a blizzard in there. <laughs> as soon as you walked into the bathroom, you heard like, <laughs> we were snorting with three hands. I was crying at the wedding. I had fucking, my nose was leaking. And my wife knew I was doing blow. She was, the poor girl was like trying to play it off. God. But what broke the wedding was when my buddy was like, I'm serious. I need a TV. And they're like, there's no TVs here. He went to the room. He went up to the room. He took the TV from the room, brought it downstairs, and he gave the stock clerk 20 bucks on extension cord. <laughs> so at the table, he had the game on. And and during the wedding? During the wedding, and he's yelling and cheering. Oh, Do you know my wife mentioned it at the divorce? She's like, at the wedding, your friend had a TV at the fucking table. Oh, did the photographer get a picture of that? I have no fucking yeah, idea. I would love to see that picture. I think I ripped all those pictures up. I ripped them all up. As soon as we got divorced, I ripped those pictures up. Did he win money that night? I have no fucking idea. Yeah. He was. I ended up. I ended up. His daughter just had cancer. That's my niece. Just had cancer. She beat at eighteen. But that's who helped me out when I got back into comedy. And it was weird because when I moved back, I moved back to Jersey in '93. I was just starting to get momentum as an open micer, and I stayed with him and his wife. His wife was pregnant. And he would go out seven nights a week and get fucked up. He would get fucked up. And he would go, I'm paying you to stay with my wife. And his wife and me would get Chinese food and sea caucus. There was a place that was open till two. Every night at 11, we'd get $50 worth of Chinese food. Egg rolls, fried cramp, rantoons, whatever the fuck you call it. Rangoon. Rangoons. We would, we would destroy that fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> so when she was pregnant I would smoke pot and she and Mike would go please don't smoke pot with a dog Yeah, and I would go what the fuck just smoke a little bit and she would smoke a little bit when the baby was born they had to keep her in the hospital for an extra day cause the baby <laughs> was fucked up the baby came on stone this fuck but she's alright she just got married a month ago in Colorado <laughs> <laughs> and she beat cancer uh, the younger sister, Alexa, yeah. was the one that had the weed. That the one I got stoned as a baby. Yeah, as a uh, fetus. As a fetus, the younger one <laughs> had the cans. Of Lindsay, which people from the church helped out and sent money to GoFundMe. She beat it. She beat it. Yeah, that you know that that embryo sucking on that umbilical cord. It's got the munchies sucking you, the marrow. <laughs> let me tell you something. I can't imagine what my mother did when I was in the system. <laughs> Yeah, I remember seeing pregnant women smoking in the seventies. Oh give yeah, a fuck. Oh yeah, they didn't give a fuck. Yeah, that that shit just started maybe fifteen years ago. Did I remember you know seeing that? a picture of my mom full belly full a baby and, a, and one of those green creme de mints. You remember those fucking? Yeah, record? she used to drink those. That was her drink. Cream de mint. She was standing there holding a bright green drink in her hand. <laughs> Well, at a certain point, weren't didn't, weren't doctors saying like cigarettes are good for you? Like nine out of ten doctors recommend Camel. Like I'm pretty sure that at one point they said it was healthy. I don't fucking think so. They just didn't know that. Like I remember when you were able to. Have you been on a plane recently where they still have ashtrays? 
Oh yeah. You ever get on the plane? Yeah. They yeah. still have ashtrays. Right. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. How old is this fucking how airplane? How old is this fucking plane? <laughs> yeah. Think of being in a plane and being able to smoke. I still remember that. Yeah. You gotta sit in the back. You gotta sit in the back. The back people would be fucking sparking yeah. up like nothing happened. Yeah. I don't remember that, but I, I remember going to restaurants as a kid, and there was a smoking section, non-smoking section. My dad used to smoke three packs a day. My mom smoked a pack a day. And we would drive. I mean, you know, it's in New York where it's cold. You got the windows up six months of the year. And uh, just chain smoking. Just sit in the back. I had asthma, too. I would, I'd be having fucking asthma attacks. And so he'd crack the window to give me some air just to crack. And then he would, I remember he would flick the cigarette at the crack. You know, like like somehow it was magically sucking the ash out. It was blowing it in the back seat. So not only we inhaling the fucking smoke, we're covered in ashes. <laughs> you know, parents really didn't give a fuck in the sixties no. and seventies. No, it was such a different fucking world. Yeah, just it, lately I've been going to. You know, I have play dates with the baby and stuff like that. And I tell you what, I see a lot. I see kids that like playing inside the house. This is the third play date that I've been on that the people have huge yards. I got a huge yard. I throw her out every day in that yard. I throw her out in the yard or I make a play in front of the house every day for at least a half hour. I took her out there yesterday and we looked at fucking flowers in front of the house, those things that you blow. Dandelions. Dandelions, just to get them because I'm sick and tired of it. We are programming. A couple months ago, I went to a beautiful house. Cuban people. Pool. Fucking jacuzzi. Huge yard. I'm sitting there watching these parents talking while the kids are running in the fucking house. There's fucking expensive lamps. You know, the whole thing. <laughs> and they're running in the house. And I'm fucking, you know, I can't relax. I can't relax because I smell the accident coming. I yeah. smell the blood. It doesn't take a fucking genius. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's eight kids running in the fucking house. And I had to fuck, like, I had to go back there and go, Mercy, get out. Like, get outside. And the other kids would go, well, we're having a good time. You know, and I finally told my wife, I go, you got to help out too. You gotta, you're got out there sitting there. This kid's going to get hurt one day. You got to come and answer to me. Because I know what you're doing. You're sitting down talking with these women when these kids are running. But this last week, I went to a, a play date. Saturday. And again, guy had a huge backyard with a fucking trampoline. They went out there for five minutes, and right away, the kids are like, I want to go inside. And they have a huge living room, and they're playing soccer, and there's glass everywhere. Yeah. And Mercy's a mule. Mercy's been playing soccer, and she's won. If Mercy could do anything, is kick a fucking ball. She was kicking. Even the people were like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, I think it's time to go outside. Yeah. And the kid's like, well, I don't want to go outside. And the parent's like, well, he doesn't want to go outside. Let's force him outside. Let's force him to go outside. You know, let's force them to get some fucking vitamin D. We, that's why these kids don't go out. I've noticed it lately. They don't go out. I don't want my daughter. You know, my daughter's only allowed to be on the computer 10 minutes. You know that, right? My, my wife's got her on the Nazi program with the timer and everything. 10 minutes a day? 10 minutes at night and 10 minutes when she gets home from school. Jeez. That's it because she doesn't want that, that work. Good. That's great. I don't want to get involved in that world. And by the way, while we're on this subject here, I don't live on social media. I check it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if every three or four hours, I check social media. So I'll go home and check Twitter if I'm out. Like I don't have Facebook on my phone. So you can face me till you're blue in the fucking face. I don't know what you're talking to me about. Facebook? Yeah, yeah right. I, even ch I check it twice a year. I don't have Facebook on my phone. Yeah. I get on Facebook for two, three minutes. I promote. Yeah. I answer some emails, but I don't check it all day long. Yeah. And the same thing with Twitter. I don't, I'm not on Twitter all day long. I check it, and I move on with my life. There are people that are on that motherfucker constantly, constantly. You look to see who's tweeting. Kate, Kate Quigley is constantly tweeting. Dean Delray, I don't know how the fuck he has the time to be good. It's a bad fucking habit. Rogan, I spoke to him last night, and he goes, I asked him how the hunting trip went. And he goes, I had a really good time. But he goes, you know what the best part of the hunting trip was? There was no internet there for mm. a week. I go, what kind of whatever did you have the first few hours? 
He goes, the first day it was a little rough. After that, it was smooth sailing. It was great to give it a fucking breather. Yeah. Guys, do me a favor. <clears throat> Scott Cunningham, the whole fucking Facebook group, all you guys, I love you to death. But stop. Go outside. Go do something. Yeah. There's guys that are around there all fucking day talking about shit that at the end of the week, it doesn't matter. It I know, and then I see, I see comics like that, and then I see them at the club, and they got no new material. They're doing the same shit. I look at them like, you know, you could have spent all that fucking time there's, there's, working on your act. It, there's a time for this, and there's a time. It's like I was telling Lee that when I was 27, locked up, a black guy in the kitchen made a comment to me. We were, we, I had like insomnia one night, and we were talking, and he goes, you know, think about all the shit you spend your energy on that's bad, and the, even the thinking. Think if you took that energy and expanded it into something good. And ever since that statement with him, I looked at everything a lot differently. I love football. I love football, but I don't have eight hours to watch football. Prior to that, I'll never forget. I could sit in Colorado, especially in Aspen, from uh, the seasons from November 18th to maybe March 15th, and then from till May, there's nothing going on in Aspen. Like, if you live in Aspen, only the locals are working. They close the restaurants, the ski shops are closed, everything's closed, and everybody goes away. I would stay. You know why I would stay, Lee? Because I would get up at 8 in the morning and get a bong. Even my girlfriend would go back to her parents' house and visit them in Boulder. And I would stay in that house all fucking day watching movies. Like, I could stay there all day going for movie with VHS. I could sit and watch six movies in one day and watch one movie twice. And I would get up to go to the bathroom, eat. But I would, have, I would do that three days a week. No shit. Watch movies. Every fucking movie that you think. When I worked at that video store, I would go there and take 10 movies. And no, no porn. They had everything. That's when the 16-year-old was sucking dick. <clears throat> what was t- t- Tracy Lloyd's? Yeah. yeah. That's when Tracy Lloyd's was huge. She yeah. put the octopus in the pussy. Uh-huh. Tracy does Japan. <laughs> yeah. Tracy does Tokyo. She put an octopus in the pussy. Like an octopus wing, one of the fucking... Cl- just one, not just, all eight. Not all eight. Of yeah. them. No, that's a fucking... That's a pisser right there. <laughs> I had eight octopus arms in my monkey. What are you fucking kidding me? And they all had a condom on. That could be a sex toy, man. You should develop the octopus. The octopus and put eight different women on there. But then you end up like fucking Judge Kerouac over here. You choke one of them, whatever his fucking name is. You can't even invent the dildo now. They'll throw you in jail. Sounds like a merry-go-round almost. Yeah, it's like a merry-go-round the Yeah, dicks. right. <laughs> like with a foot in between them and shit. How yeah. funny would that be? <laughs> I was telling them a story one time at the Ice House. I went to this gay bar, Ram Runs, and on certain nights, like I didn't know, every night they had a different theme night. And one night I went in there, like one night it was piss on somebody night, like spit on somebody night, like there'd be a guy on the third floor in a yeah. tub. But I went in there one time, and there was a guy, and they were playing like a Wheel of Fortune. It wasn't called Wheel of Fortune. It was called, like, Spin the Cock. <coughs> and the guy, would, they would tie him up naked, like, like, like Jesus, but spread his legs. <laughs> on and, a wheel. On a wheel. And if he won the, the ballot or whatever, they would make him go upside down and somebody would suck his <laughs> dick while he was upside down. <laughs> and I'll never forget. The, the winner or the loser? I don't know. I don't know what the fuck. But I'll never forget going in there one night on a lewd looking for a gram of blow. Like, me and my buddies... <laughs> Like, that was the last resort to get blow. <laughs> and we went in there, and everybody was around this, like, you know, cheering, go, 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 go. And I'm at the bar, like, yeah, let me get a gram of blow. And the guy's like, hold on five minutes. And I'm like, what's going on over there? And it's like, it's, oh, you didn't know? Because he was gay as fuck, this guy. <laughs> His name was Joe Gash. He goes, you didn't know? It's, you know, Wheel of Cock Night or whatever. So I go over, and this poor bastard is upside down, and this fucking Puerto Rican with a little mustache and a little earring is sucking that pipe. But oh, I figured out, like, I didn't know this for years. Like, this type of shit, you're not supposed to see that when you're 18. But here's the thing I don't, here's the thing I don't understand about Joey Diaz and the church, what's happening in general. If I had one story that good, 
you would know I had that story because I would have told. I would have already told it thirty times. This is one of many. That's what I'm saying. But, but I thought about it, and I thought about one thing. I'll never forget that he was sucking the guy's dick, and I was behind him, and all these gay guys were like, "Go, go, yeah. go, yeah. go." <laughs> <laughs> And I finally went Is over. bankrupt bankrupt? You got to eat his uh, asshole. No, I don't know. I don't know. The guy's upside down. He's yelling because the blood's in his head. So this guy's sucking mm. his dick. But I'll never forget that <laughs> something made me go around to look at what the guy what looked like that was sucking his dick, and he was sucking it. You understand me? When all the blood goes to your head, I don't think your dick gets hard. So this guy had both his cheeks connected, like he was like. <laughs> And I never forgot, like, at that time, I don't even think I got my dick sucked. Like, that's pretty interesting. That guy, that guy's sucking for his life. Like, he was sucking for his fucking life. He... <laughs> I love how you pass out of the set of blood, but you just sit there and watch this. I watched it for about a minute, and then I went back, got my grandma Coke, and left, and never said nothing to nobody. It was nobody's business. You know what I'm saying? I saw a guy get his dick upside down. Who says that type of shit to people? <laughs> Who watches that type of shit? You gotta watch it if it happens in front of you at least one time. He had to wait for his coke. You, know? you gotta wait for the coke. I might as well watch oh. what's going on. What's going on with the talent? You know what I'm saying? Maybe I want to <laughs> jump in. I would love to get my dick sucked if I was upside down. I think I'd get a panic attack thinking back like if my head is underneath. I don't care how hot she is. If she's just sucking my dick. Well, it's a race between passing out and coming. Is that what it is? Yeah. I think I think you hear about these people that uh, ex- asphyxiate themselves while they masturbate, and I've always thought, you know, I've masturbated for a lot of years and I'm good, but could I take it to another level? No. But I'm afraid. What if I did and and I and I forgot to let go of my neck or whatever? That's that's not the way you want to be. So, okay, so like the guy from the excess, he goes into a room. I think he was in a closet and he put 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 his belt around his neck. You put your belt around your neck and you hold one and pick your weight up? I guess. Or you so. just choke yourself? I think you have to tie it off because isn't that how David Carradine, one of the Carradine brothers, died doing that? And then Robin Williams is supposedly. Am I wrong? So, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's go back here. So it's like suicide while you're jerking off. And yeah, you try happens. to choke yourself. You know how when you're getting choked out, you get lightheaded and a little yeah. euphoric? Yeah. So I guess you combine that with masturbation and it takes. To me, masturbation, after all these years is still so fucking good. Like I don't I don't picture making it better. It's like it's all in my control. It's joy, it's a release. There's a little shame afterwards, but the actual experience of it, I still can't believe after all these years there's nothing that I still enjoy as much as that one activity. And there's nothing else close. You know, when it comes to me I like banging one out, but I like banging them out on the road. Yeah. Like in the shower. In the shower. Like, I love banging one out in the shower when I can lay down and sit and I got time. I condition my hair. I shave. You lay down in the shower? I love that shit. I, oh, for years. I lay down in the shower. To me, it's if when I get off a plane, oh, that's the thing I look most forward to when I land, at, at a, especially at a hotel. That's why when I go to these fancy smancy hotels, yeah. they don't have a shower curtain. Yeah. <laughs> they oh, don't yeah, have the yeah. whole glass anymore. They don't they have piss, a tub. Yeah. yeah, they piss me off. I turn the hot water on. I fucking smoke a half a numb, but sometimes I'll take a little piece of a Xanax. And I just sit in the hot water and I fucking think. I wait till it gets hot, nice and steamy, 20 minutes in, you shave. It's like shaving through butter. Yeah. You know? How long are you in there for altogether? Sometimes an hour. <laughs> sometimes two hours. <laughs> the fucking room, the shower at the... Uh, you're gonna get a call the, from the uh, from Greenpeace about that where, one. Where, I don't give a fuck. Where's uh, <laughs> where's uh, what's the hotel I stay at? South Point. South Point Shower is where the brick ends. Yeah. All the way to there. Yeah. You walk in. You open up the thing. They have a sink in the shower, and then they have a gun, and then they have a shower. And then they have water that comes out of the walls. And they have a little bench. You know how many times I've gotten up there at 4 <laughs> in the morning, rolled a fucking joint, smoked it, gotten toasted? Because I paid a 250 fine there. I don't give a fuck. Because by the time they... It's just a big room. 
I'll pay. I'll smoke a joint in the bathroom. I'll sit there from four to six thirty. <laughs> Thinking about my life. Imagine joke. the neighbor, Lee. You know, because you could hear that shower going no, in the next can. room in the no, hotel. Oh, no, he has a big room in, at the. At the but, he knows it's up. He's been in there. Yeah. But you, but you used to do that when you were big, right? You used to I, sleep in there. I love when I had the sleep apnea. I realized that the only way I could fall asleep is if I was on an angle. Yeah. And uh, you know, you go to these people's houses. They're rich, and you ever take a shower at somebody rich's house? One point eight million, two million dollars. After ten minutes, I got no hot water. You got a waste of the house. Yeah, <laughs> you got your house is a waste. Yeah. Ten minutes, and I got I got to wait another half hour for the water right. to get hot. You got beat. Right. I lived in a building in Hollywood that they had one of those old tanks. Do you know I used to sleep in there? <laughs> You'd keep the water running while you slept. Because that's the only way I could sleep when I had to sleep at me. I was four hundred pounds. So I would go in the tub, I'd take a pillow, and I'd put a garbage bag on it. One of those, <laughs> one of those fucking hefty, 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 so whippy, whippy, whippy. <laughs> I would fucking close off the pillow. I would put it behind me. I would put the hot water on it, and it would hit like my stomach. Mm. And I'd just fucking sleep there. When I'd wake up, the paint would be peeling off the wall. <laughs> Before we moved there, we had to paint the bathroom. I peeled the primer off the wall. Sheetrock was coming off. Mold. The fucking top was just mold. Yeah. And you could see where it was just drip with brown mold. Every time you would paint it, the mold would Jesus. come right through. When I fucking first got diagnosed with sleep apnea, that's the only way I could sleep. I love showers. Yeah. I've always loved showers. I don't understand dirty people whatsoever. Do you take baths? No. I don't want to bathe in the same water, the germs that came out. I want the stuff to flush. Okay. I want to sit. Baths, baths is something like drinking for me. Like in the 70s, when you watch a TV show, if Greg walked in here in the 70s, I would turn around and have a bar with a bottle filled with a brown booze. It could be scotch, bourbon, whiskey. You don't know, but you didn't have the balls to ask. I poured two of them and I just gave it to you. That was the 70s. That's what we learned from... I don't even know where I'm going with this conversation. <laughs> but... Uh, bats. Oh, bats. Bats has always been something else that seemed overrated. You ever see, you ever see some people on TV, they take a bath and it's like their whole world changes. Oh, dude, I love baths. They get in there with bubbles and they, they sit back yeah. drop a music. Right, right. And then they close their eyes and they make believe they're having a good time. Yeah. That's two minutes for me. Yeah. That's like a hand job. Uh -huh. I don't like that shit. I want action. I want continuous hot right. water. Well, what about a jacuzzi it. tub? <sighs> that sounds like the answer for you. No, I like, I like the water coming on. I like yeah. the water hitting me in the face. <laughs> I like water hitting me on the titties, on my stomach. I sit in the back. I'll just sit there with one leg up like a thinker. Yeah. I'll just go in there and clear my head up. You know, when we were <laughs> clear going Clear out through, the fucking we reservoir going, of that we, town, too. When we were going through a drought here in L.A., you couldn't take showers. And I lived next to hippies. When I lived on Hudson, I lived next to hippies. So I would take showers and they would yell, there's a water restriction. I would go, fuck you. <laughs> so now I couldn't, you know, abuse the water in L.A. I would take six, seven minute showers. Yeah. But when I go on the road, that's the first thing I do. When I get off a plane, listen, you ever, you ever wait to get on a plane? You see what comes off that plane? It's like jungle fucking fever. It's somebody from every different country Ooh. breathing something fucking else. No wonder there's a fucking travel ban. <laughs> Lee just made it an audible. You, you make that fucking... I'm, 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 I'm telling you from your face here, guys. I'm not trying to be racist or a bad person, but look at all the people that are coming off that plane, all the national, all the different countries they come in from. What do you think that plane is? One big germ. Didn't we just have to land the plane because people got off the plane coughing oh, right. in Philadelphia and these international right. fights? I'm not lying to you. Before, how can you... Now, let me ask you a question, Greg Fitzsimmons. Just so people know, home of that lion. Have you ever seen the last person get off? Oh, it's, yeah. How long till they start boarding? Yeah. Two minutes. Yeah. They don't even spray Lysol on the fucking Oh, no, plane. they're waiting. By the time... If you are if you board from the back of the plane, by the time you get to the 10th row, that army has already... They've already been on. They've already cleared the first 10 rows. And they're worried by the time... Five minutes later, that thing is gone. The only thing they got time to do is steal your shit. Because I have left about a half a dozen things on planes in the last few years. Laptop, computer, a phone, a couple hats, nice hats. Nothing ever gets returned, and I always fill out the accident. Those people are fucking, they're thieves. They're thieves. I, granted, they're probably being underpaid, whatever, but that shouldn't make you a thief. 
You know, they got the bag, the garbage bag. They take your computer, they put it inside, they hold on to it, and then they uh, and then they sell it later. Well, they had that TSA guy who had like a house full of iPads. Oh no, shit! That was a couple of years ago. Let me look it really? up. Really? Yeah. No, yeah. but I don't trust planes just because of the fact that lights all the plane down. And at least in first class, get them wipes and wipe down the headrest. Yeah. I don't know where this guy's fucking hair has been. Right. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck. Maybe he was at that fucking gay bar last night getting his dick sucked. <laughs> and his hair was touching 20 pounds of sperm from the 80s. I don't fucking know. What about that TV screen? You know. They have to touch to order all, stuff. All that stuff. All that stuff I bring handy wipes with me. Yeah. Like my wife got me a thing of handy wipes. I put it under, behind the lamp. Do you really? Oh, yeah, man. I wipe down my fucking handles. When I get off a plane, there's one thing for me to do, and that's take a shower. As soon as I get off that plane, I get in my Uber, whether it's going or coming. When I get home on Sundays, my kids are already gone. They're at church. My wife is at church already. So I'm walking in at 930. I unload everything. I put what belongs in my office in the office. I put the laundry away. I strip down naked and I go in that fucking in that shower and I scrub, tub, wub, everything comes off. Then I take the homecoming shit because all weekend. Watch your shit before the shower. Because no, I do take the homecoming shit before the okay. shower. I'm lying to you. Sure. I take the forty inch shit. Right. <laughs> Because the whole weekend, your asshole isn't accustomed to the toilet yeah, you're right. shitting on, so it's embarrassed. Yeah. It only lets out like eight-inch dumps or four <laughs> inches, little Cuban cigars. You're like, what the <laughs> fuck? What's going on in my system? Let me tell you something. As soon as my asshole hits the 101, yeah. that little magneto from the 405 <laughs> to the 101, and I blast that one fart in the fucking uh, in that Uber, and I got to open up the window, and the Uber driver's talking fucking Arabic on the phone to his cousin. And I blast that fucking pre-fart, that last blast of three fucking days of eating yeah. on the road. Your body's not used to that. As soon as I walk in, I just drop my luggage, go to the bathroom, and it's like a 40-inch Oh yeah, it just comes out, Curls. And breaks in half. You break the break the surface it of the looks, water. That's like, a victory. It looks like a question mark. Sometimes <laughs> the Riddler took a shit in my bathtub. <laughs> I take a picture and send it to Thompson. You sent it to me a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I didn't... <laughs> God damn it! You can't unsee that shit either. No, you can't. I don't, and I won't put it on Twitter no more because then people send you shit pictures. You used to, oh, you used to put it on Twitter? No, if it's a good one, you got to like if it breaks in half, <laughs> it looks like a cane that's broken. What the one I sent him looked like it was a boot stick. Yeah. yeah. Skinny. Was, that, yeah, it was really skinny, but yeah. it was longer than fuck. It was like the hemorrhoid. Yeah. Tapped into the shit and put a dent in it. It's like when you shoot a bullet, you can tell what gun it belongs to. If somebody looks at that shit, they're like, this came out of Joey Diaz's ass. It's got the markings. Like a mugshot. Like a mugshot. I had to text him like three or four times so it stopped showing up in the, in the window. And I didn't even see it. I saw it like two days later. You didn't say a word. I must have missed the text and an open mic or something. Oh my God, that's terrible. Uh. <laughs> What's unbelievable is when you, uh, <coughs> it's so long that the head of it goes down, down the drain. Oh, I like that. Down the tube. So you're only seeing, it's like a, it's like a, uh, iceberg. You're only seeing the top, the body, you already clogged up the, the, the pipe. And then you get a swirl going on, on a real soft, thin one. You can get a swirl going that keeps snaking. And you think, I don't think I was rotating my pelvis on that, but that is a perfect curl. And it's about, you know, 1,800 degrees of That's curl. A menchie yogurt type thing. Yes. It's like one of the Menchies. And then on the last, and then when you clip it and you look down and you broke the water, that's that's a that's a celebration. The one I like is the one where I'm sitting there and I got to push it for a couple minutes. And then it feels like I can feel my asshole uh, expanding with <laughs> yeah. a ball constrictor. Yeah. Like I can feel it actually like going. Like you're about to give birth? Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Going, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Oof, so I always got to go like, ugh. <laughs> and I look down, and it's like a fucking, it's like a 22-incher. Yeah. But in the middle, it's got like two little, like it looks like a snake that ate like a two birds. <laughs> it's got like a lump in the front and a lump in the back. <laughs> oh, my God, those are tremendous. I like the ones that come out clean. Like clean, you, you don't like really you have yeah. to wipe your ass. Oh, yeah. yeah, They call those that a, uh, a white flag, I think. Because <laughs> well, on, on the white, you get nothing on it. the intelligence level on the podcast this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing we're not running for president. But then if you're if you're photographing it, that means you got to take the toilet paper after you wipe, and you got to try to drop it in front of it or behind it, so you get a clean shot of the shit. Like, what did you do when you sent that picture to Lee? I just took it. Took it. And it's not every day. But where day. was the toilet paper in the in the photograph? I don't think I had. I didn't need that. Oh, you. T- 
What? Sometimes. Sometimes if I know <laughs> what? Sometimes it's clean. Sometimes you just wipe it. You How do you know? Because you wipe it. Oh, on the first wipe, if yeah. you get a if you get a white sheet, you walk away. No, I wait a couple more minutes because there's always a by the way. There's always <laughs> I hate something. that. There's always <laughs> something. And then you get in the car and leave somewhere yeah. and your, your ass is spicy. Yeah. Like it has a little burn to it. And then you go home and you put toilet paper and there's a little piece of shit in your ass. So I always wipe it and then give it a few minutes. That's why yeah. I have a door in my bathroom to the outside and I smoke pot. Because when I cough, whatever's stuck in there will come out at the same time. <laughs> so when you go, all of a sudden you blah, 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 it starts dropping out. That's something I invented. So if you use it, give me credit for it. Don't come out and see it in 10 years. Smoking marijuana while taking this shit is good for your health. <laughs> and the whole time I had been doing it since fucking I moved into this place. You should make like a bathroom bong. Like they have the squatty potty that helps. You should make like right. a smoking kit for the bathroom. All right. No, because every time I, I smoke, that's what I do. I get off that plane. I, I put my shit away and I go in that bathroom. I open up the back door. I can't I, imagine. I always save a nug of the best weed I took. Yeah. So I don't have to go right to the weed store. There's always weed waiting for me on Sunday. Yeah. I fucking blast that off. Boom, the shower, and I'm good for Sunday. I don't do dick on Sunday. I just can't imagine. I'm trying to picture Joey Diaz. And, and again, I don't, I don't want to picture your ass, but I'm picturing your ass taking a 22-inch dump and followed by one wipe. That frightens me. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> that's piece. like that's like the the fucking, you know. That's like a ship going down. And you send out you send out one life preserver after it. Sometimes I take toilet paper and take a rip of it and put it down first. So when the shit lands, it doesn't go splash. Down easy. Yeah. What? That's yeah, yeah, I do that. That's how much of a professional I am. I do that. So what, you, like yeah. you lay a base for it to land on, yeah. and it doesn't splash. Yeah, like you make a, a runway, nest, like a little runway. Like so, the plane knows where to land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You pull a little runway, the asshole sees it, it dips it right there. So when you flush, it goes down even easier. You don't got to clean the bathroom if you're at somebody's house or a hotel. You gotta... That's right. It's it's These courtesy. Are, it's a courtesy, courtesy move. This is what gentlemen do. I've never I've heard I've heard like eight thousand shit stories. I've never heard of laying down until it. That's before. why the church is here. So you can always learn. See, the church is not about ha ha's and ease. We want you to take something home with you that you learned something. You know, I learned this today on the church. I didn't know that if you put paper down first, it goes down the rabbit hole a lot easier. Just to yeah, to it's the lessons that are learned. It so, is like it's like an after school special. You always walk away feeling a little moved and a little informed. I never knew that story about you about college. That's that's something that stays with you for life. Yeah. You know, I don't drink and drive. I just I refuse. I barely smoke pot and drive. I don't like drinking and driving. You know why? When I was 18, I saw an RX-7 fucking hit a pole, and I heard the girl yelling inside. Yeah. My boyfriend's dead. Get me out, oh, man. The Jesus. jaws of life. And the fireman was on top of the car cutting, and you could see the blood on the windshield. And I made a mental note. That was PTSD for me. That's like, you know... I, I, I didn't look at it from... I haven't really looked at it from that perspective in the last couple of weeks. I think because you have an older daughter, you look at it from that perspective. The shock value. You know, I give thanks every day. I give thanks to the Lord for letting me live to be 55. I give thanks to being at this point in my career. But I give thanks for when my mother died that I didn't, didn't get taken in by animals. Yeah. Like, I could look you in the eye and tell you as a man that anybody I had contact with in those days, nothing had to do with a sexual thing that fucked with me in my head. Right. I'm very fortunate that I was around legit Americans, you know, that nobody took me in to fucking molest me or do crazy. But I couldn't imagine the afterburner effect of it. You know, it's like Joe asked me one time, do you ever have a girlfriend that killed herself or something? I go, I know I would kill myself if I sucked my own dick. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, if I knew I sucked my disgusting (laughs) dick, I would kill myself. But that's just me being honest. You know? So you're shocked that any girl that sucked your dick is not yet suicidal? No, no, no. I'm just saying that. You You wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) I always. Or they all have a kind of a. A f- even if they seem okay, there's like a little bit of a faraway look in their eyes. Like there's something they're not quite over yet. There's something that they've seen that's that they can't still, unsee. They can't unsee it. Or taste. <laughs> I saw a girl about 10 years ago that I had dated for a while. Hot and off. You know, we would get high. And 
and I'll never forget that one night I saw her at the store or something. And she goes, can you give me a ride home? At that time, I had a girlfriend. I had no intention of banging her. She was just drunk. And she was, you know, she was taunting me to go up store. She was testing me to see what my loyalties were. Yeah. And before she got out of the car, she looked at me and she goes, you know what I've always thought about? That I licked your balls. And she got out of the car and slammed the door. And she goes, you know how disgusting that is? <laughs> <laughs> she would get hammered and suck my dick and lick my balls. And she said, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> What do you say to that? <laughs> Nothing. Goodbye. <laughs> Good night. I guess the night's over. I wasn't even looking for a nookie cookie or nothing. She was drunk and she she said, fine, you're not coming up to have a nightcap. And I'm like, no, I'm going home. <laughs> you know, I don't drink and drive. And she's like, fine then. And then she was getting out. She looked at me. She goes, you know, you know what I've always thought about on a daily basis? That I licked your disgusting balls at one time. And she slammed the door. Whatever. <laughs> whatever whatever drives you through life. I ate your pussy too, and it wasn't no fucking cream to the crumb either, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I had a couple lines of me, I'm eating this fucking yeast infected fucking thing. I wake up with a fucking roll in my mouth, you know what I'm saying? With a butter roll in my mouth. <laughs> 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 when you're coked up and doing drugs, you'll eat anything. Yeah. I ate a girl one time. That I could see the chlamydia juice. No, stop it. Like it dripped and it, yeah. had, like oh, it, like it had dripped Jesus out. Christ. It, it had dried. Uh-huh. It had dried. <laughs> and I'm there licking the noodle and I look down and I see this little like <laughs> like the Lee Syak's chin after a bong hit. You know, yeah, and, and he has the nerve to, to yell at me about where I eat tacos. But you're, you're licking chlamydia juice. Who gives a fuck? Oh. At least you're having a good time. You eat that doesn't sound like a good time to me. Shit, uh. tacos and hummus, you got a fly chasing you. I'm surprised you don't have a fly on your neck tonight, you filthy fuck. <laughs> he eats that hummus. He always has a pet fly. This guy's the only guy that's got a pet fly. And he brings every You have pet him. flies. No, I don't. It's you. Every time I kill he's one, got, I throw him out. What do you mean? He's got flies that follow him? All the time. Oh he's got a fly around his neck all the time. He eats something. When he leaves the door open, he No, he doesn't. Oh. I leave the fly, and the fly will come right in and sit on his lap. He's over there petting him like a fucking sir. He's just, he's got a service fly. It's fucking, it's fucking mobile. A seeing eye fly? Yeah, he got like a little service fly. That's his friend and shit to help him out. This guy shows up at the end, but I got a board first. Me and my service fly. <laughs> Is it on a leash or? I got service flies. Listen, I open when I, that little bathroom I take shits in. Yeah. yeah. I have all my weed. Wait, which bathroom? The bathroom of my house. Yeah. I have a back bathroom connected to my office. <laughs> and I can open the door and take a shit in there. And it's funny that Is I. Is that the only place you shit in the house? Yeah, because I'm just cause controversy anywhere else. Yeah. The other bathroom <laughs> is in between Mercy and my wife's room. I'll fuck that bathroom up. Yeah. And the other bathroom is outside of Mercy's door, and it's just too small. Like, I feel claustrophobic in there. I can't move. There's too, too much shit going on. This to- I can't shit when there's toys. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's toys right. and dolls. And there's like a little black doll looking at shit. It's hard yeah. for me to take a shit. <laughs> now, you want to see you, you want to see an Ace Freely bobblehead doll yeah, when you're want, taking a I shit. I want my legs loose. Yeah. I like my legs outward. Yep. I, I take a leg out of the pants. Do you? Oh, fuck. Yeah, I want to be loose. I don't want that. <laughs> you're going to fuck somebody with handcuffs on their legs? Why would you do that to yourself? I take the shit, I take the legs out of the pants, I open up those two legs like I fucking own the fort. Wait, what about in public bathrooms? That too. I don't no give a f- fucking yeah, way. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> if you're looking in here, it means you're looking for dick to the people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, man, you're supposed to be like a catcher. I you get down and squat. I take the leg out, and then I rip my one ass cheek out, <laughs> and I put it on the toilet seat so there's no misunderstanding. No. So my asshole is in perfect oh, position. Oh, it's like when the Koreans are going to send the missile. You know, that thing moves over. <laughs> Just like that. I'm positioned to open up the fucking thing. And once I sit, I can't get up. Because yeah. if you get up, my ass sticks to the toilet seat and my nutsack will go under the toilet thing and I'll sit on it. You know how many times? Because I don't put my balls in the toilet. I don't do that because I respect what? women. No, I don't sit all the way back. I put my balls over. I take toilet paper and put it on the toilet seat. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in case my you wife don't put it on the balls. seat. No, I don't want, I don't want people to I, Joe, I've never heard of it. Anybody putting their balls on a toilet seat in my I'm life? I'm careless. I don't want, I don't want my wife to lick a thousand set of balls if she licks my balls. I've been doing this since I was single. I don't want a woman licking bad balls, so I'll put toilet paper down 
<laughs> put my nutsack on it. But if I get up, yeah, like if I get up to flush or something, yeah, sometimes the toilet seat sticks to my nutsack, to, uh, to my leg skin, <laughs> and my nuts go under the toilet seat. You know how many times, oh, I've, you know how many times I've crashed? You know how many times I smashed my oh. my nuts under the toilet seat because I've got up for a oh, reason? Oh no! Yeah, more than and, once. Oh, I now I hold them. Now, after years, I hold them when I get up to do anything, and then I sit back down. Yeah. I have a whole process. So, wait, you're at the front but, of the toilet? But I'm trying to tell my brother oh, here okay, I'm sorry. that I, instead of taking, you see you see those containers of weed? Yeah. Those are all new. So, instead of throwing them away, what I do is I have these flies that get caught in the bathroom, Yeah. and they get caught in like a glass, and they get all fucking retarded. You ever see a fly when they're in the glass by the sun? Yeah. They get like their the vision is lost. So they start getting close to me. So I take one of those cans and I leave the dust in it from the weed. And I take the fly, I'll hit it. Like, oh, I'll just capture it and I'll take like a wing off and I'll put them in there and I'll close them in there and I'll put holes on top of the fucking thing so they can breathe. And I just leave them in there. It's so like experiment with weed for three or four days, just the corners. <laughs> So get me flies I let out and they don't want to go nowhere. Like well, that. they don't have wings anymore. No, they don't have one wing. They can still fly part time. You know what I'm saying? It's a one way trip. Yeah, they can take a lot of lefts. Oh my God, you have no idea how much fun I have with those flies. I got like three of them. I got two of them in there now. They've been in there for like well, two fuck days. Fuck it. Would the flies live a week? Let them. Let them have a good half a life. I take a little uh, Starbucks coffee stick and I take a little piece of shit and I'll feed it to them just to keep them alive and shit. I. It's like a weed THC lumber. What do you call those chocolate bars with nuts around them? <laughs> like, they give away on Christmas, what you, the little truffles. So they get like a little weed truffle. They get shit wrapped up with little weed butt, and they get fucking crazy. Yeah, he's like days. Hannibal Lecter feeding the girl in oh, the yeah. well. I'm just going to have to ask my therapist about this. <laughs> like, I don't know what, <laughs> what is this. <laughs> now, where do you get the shit? That's not your shit. Yes, it is. No, I borrow it from the guy next door. <laughs> yeah, it's my shit. Like, I go next door and knock on his door. You take a shit yet? Let me fucking scoop some up and feed it to so my pet. So you got a stick and you take a shit and you... You didn't take that test yet when you're 50 where you take a little piece of your shit and mail it in? But not to feed a fly. <laughs> You take that. That's why I don't use those Starbucks sticks. You ever go to Starbucks and have those wood sticks? Yeah, those yeah. are the same ones you yeah. use to cut the shit and put it and send it to the doctor's yeah. office. Why don't you just use your cat uh, shit? You have cats. Because that's not fair. They don't want cat shit. They want good human shit. It's like giving them. This is grass fed, reefer. This is free range you know, jelly. I'm, 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 I'm eating chicken from Kansas City. <laughs> That's been kicked in the cage. I, I take care of my flies. You know what I'm saying? I want my flies to have the best nourishment. <laughs> they got to be strong. They got to be strong. Yeah. And then I got to eat weed for two days. There was like three flies. I turned over. The shit was gone. There was a little THC dust left. They just lived on my counter for like four days. I went away. I came back. There was one left. I don't know what happened to the two other ones. <laughs> What if the flies talk about you now? They're like, you should go in that guy's house. Yeah. He shows you a good time. He's got good shit. I don't give a fuck. That's what I wanted to I wanted to get the word out. Or don't go there. <laughs> don't, um, the, the main thing is to tell their friends, don't go in there. The guy's fucking medieval. He put me in a fucking... He was like the black guy from Pulp Fiction. He got four hard cracking pipe motherfuckers to come over here and go medieval on your ass. And I always take one of their wings off. I always take one of their wings off just to let them know who the boss is. And then I got to wash my hands 18 times because of the disgusting flies. <laughs> They're born out of shit. Oh, yeah. Dog. Oh, yeah. That's nasty. Yeah, we used to have cockroaches in oh, college, no. freshman year. The, the dorm rooms, because all the kids were drinking beer, and we wanted to get the five cents back. So you'd, you'd keep, you have three cases of beer cans or bottles in your room, you know, stashed under your desk under the bed and the cockroaches would come and that's like a superfood for a cockroach beer they love that shit and so there was so many on the dresser i would take a uh, a cup from the cafeteria a clear a clear cup and i'd put the roaches underneath it i catch them throw it under and there would be like a death match it'd be like eight or ten cockroaches and they would they would they would start eating each other after a while and they would they would they would lock off, and then one would die, and they'd all eat the body. Then another one would die, and they would attack each other, and that was entertainment for us for a year. How would you catch the roaches again? You just grab them, and then you slide them under the cup. Oh, so you put the cup over them? Yeah. And then you just put them into the jar. Yeah. How big were the roaches? Water Fucking bug? big? No, not water bug big. You know, like I would say, 
half the size of your pinky. I don't know what it is or what it, since I was a kid, I've hated flies. I fucking hated flies. I've been killing flies for 55 fucking years. Yeah. I hate flies. I'm good at it, too. I yeah. got quick hands with flies. I, I zero I can catch. Them. I can catch the big ones. I I the small the ones big, are tough. I can catch them or kill them. Yeah. I know how to. I know how to de-able them, like how to like fuck them up a little bit. Yeah, just to just clap them, and they're still alive. Because if you smack them, the shit comes out of the back, and they're dead. Then they yeah. don't live. But you <laughs> just gotta be able just to smack them, and I know exactly how to do it. I fucking hate flies, man. Well, you know the key is they say to come up directly behind them. They can't see behind them, so when they're sitting on the counter, take your hand flat and just move it slowly, and you can uh-huh. literally get you can get within an inch of that fly. And then once you're there, they sense it's a kick. It. Yeah, but they sense they have sensors. They sense movement. Movement. So you got to move so slow they don't notice you coming up. And then once you're there, you just you just you don't even have to move your hand that fast. Just close just close it as you move in their direction. You got it. And then I slam it on the ground till they get dizzy. And then I pick them up and take them outside. I Greg, them I don't out. know if a lot of people know, especially from the church. You haven't been on in a while. You've been writing for the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. You been, went back to. And not a fucking regular show, but a hit show, Crashing. Crashing, Two yeah. Two seasons? Yeah, last day. It's been on for three. I did the second and the third season. And, um, you know, I've been, but I've been right ever since my son was born. So, like, 16 years I've been writing on shows almost every year. Like, I usually, I get my, I get a job. I make sure I make enough where I get my health coverage for the year so I can go talk to a shrink so I can get some shots in my ass, whatever I need. It's taken care of by the Writers Guild. Just got to make sure I work a certain amount of months, and every year I get it. Uh, but this, these past two years have been much more full time. You know, like this show, this show is like we work a couple months in L.A. and then we go to New York for like three and a half months. So in L.A., you do the beginning of the writing. Yeah, we write the scripts. We we pitch the ideas. You know, it's a lot of comics, and uh, we sit in a room. Ian Ian Edwards has been a part of it the last couple of years, and uh, Jamie Lee, and you know Pete Holmes, and. So we sit in a room, we all just tell road stories, just like what's the most twisted shit that happened to you on the road? What, you know, waitress that you hooked up with at the back of the condo or a club owner that fucked you over. And you just tell these stories and then they they get put on cards up on the wall. And then later on, we're trying to figure out episodes and we pull from those. And it's really weird because you see like like this past season, there was a story right out of my act that we ended up shooting not out of my act, out of my life. There's something that happened to me on the road. And I pitched it out, all of a sudden, you know, you're shooting it with actors, and you're like, this is fucking trippy, you know? And uh, But but I think it's, uh, it's the best way to write for me, is like just stories. It's tough to sit in a room, and uh, I've written on shows where the characters are prefabbed. It's like those houses you buy, and then they move them to the site, and they plop them down. That's what the scripts feel like. Like, this is what the network likes, they want uh, they want four characters, workplace. You know these these two are dating, and there's so many rules that by the time you write the script, there's no creativity left. And with a show like this, it all starts from just stories. And so you sit around, you tell a good story, and then you don't have to stop down. The thing about HBO or Amazon or or Netflix is you don't. First of all, you can curse, you can show sex, whatever. Second of all, you don't get notes from the network. HBO does not send notes. We shoot the show, you know. If they, if if we get notes, it's minimal, very minimal, and they say we trust you. It's Judd Apatow. Do your thing, and then at the end of it, lock up. Give us the keys. We'll let you know if you can do another season. That's it. And then we also don't have uh, commercial breaks. So one of the things about uh, sitcoms that's so hard is that there's two commercial breaks. So you got to have two cliffhangers in every episode. You got to have twice. Where you got the audience where he's like, we got to give them something that they're going to sit through a fucking uh, a Matthew McConaughey ad for a car and a watch commercial and a Mr. Clean commercial. And, and, and so it falsely puts things into the story that build up the stakes. So you got to deal with that. So if you're not dealing with that dynamic or notes from the network, then you can actually write stories that flow. I like the show. I When I first watched it the first season... It took a couple episodes for me to fall in love with it because it brought me back to my open mic in 93. Right. When I was walking around New York, there was no barking yet. There was no barking, but you still had to sell tickets for people to come to your show. Yeah. 
So they would like uh, what is his name, Lucifer over at Lucian Holt. Lucian at Holt the comic strip would give you twenty tickets to sell for forty bucks, and you kept twenty. And you gave them twenty. They never got that twenty from me. <laughs> I just sold the tickets and kept the money. Right, right. <laughs> and then depending on how many tickets you sold, you get stage time. Like that was my thing, you know. You guys did an episode where he started dating a girl, and they went to NACA. Right. And she did well and he didn't. And that's the Or he did well and she didn't. He did well and she didn't. Yeah. And it was the it was a great episode for me because it was like that's why you don't date a comic. Yeah. Like these are the lessons where you don't date a comic, you know. You had him do a warm up work. Which it it just took the comic through different levels. For a guy like me, I enjoy it. I watched it every Sunday when it came on and because we do the podcast at eight. So we get the show at like six or six Uh thirty on in California, yeah, so I liked it, yeah, and I like the one on Showtime too. Believe it or not, I like them both. I'm dying up here. Yeah, I like yeah. them both. You right. know, they're not. Well, one's a drama and one's a comedy, so they're different enough, you know. And uh, I think the tone is very different with their show. I think there's a lot more stakes about success, whereas with Pete, it's as much about his journey as a person leaving the Christian faith and getting exposed to kind of this dark, this darker world and his transition out of that and having relationships for the first time. So I think in this past season, it's probably more about career than the other ones were uh, because he was still getting his footing, I think, personally, in the first two first two seasons. It's a, it's a weird place to be where Pete is on that show. Yeah. It's a weird place to be as a comic. You're in the middle of that world, you know, and you have to have the cer- certain humbleness to you. You have to, you know, keep your mouth shut. Keep your ears open, you know. You guys had him going from couch to couch for a while. The funny thing is the him and Artie perspective. Yeah. Which I always thought Artie should have been a lot bigger with him and scared him. Like, when I first started comedy, I had a guy named Rick Kearns, who I love dearly. I still speak to Rick. He's a writer also. He, he writes for Ron White. And... My first couple experiences on the road with him were just like, I don't think I can handle this. Like, I don't think I'm going to, what are you talking about? Like, the first time I, he goes, I'd be at my house at four to pick me up. Pick you up. And I got there, and he's like, all right, park your car over here. We're taking my truck. Um, You're driving. I can't drive. I got three DUIs. And then the first stop is at the liquor store. And he goes in, he comes out, and he takes out half a Gatorade and puts the whole thing of vodka in there. And then we had to stop at his Coke dealer's house. And he came out of the car, you know, it's four in the afternoon, and he's like, all right, get on the interstate. And and you're learning about his car, and he's scaring the shit out of me. The more, you know, you want a sip of this, and not only is he drinking the vodka and the whatever, but he's drinking, uh, and I'm not talking about Rick Kearns in particular, I'm talking about when I first started, I would work with other comics, that while they were drinking, they had a bottle, and they were drinking that. They were doing drugs. They'd stop to gamble. And I'm like, is this what I want to be? Yeah. I worked with a guy that killed himself a couple of years, about 2000. He hung himself at the lap stop. Oh, you, yeah? You remember that guy? He was. He, he, they said the guy, guy was really, really was going to be a star. But the drugs, he got deals. This He was a star. I met him. In, oh, I know who you're talking about. I met him in 93. And people were like, bro, that dude's a badass comic. Drugs and shit just fucked him up. And I'll never forget, it was that was the situation. He took a bus in from Denver. And I picked him up somewhere in Boulder. And from the minute he got in the car, I was like, all right, let's go for booze. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We're professionals. What are you talking about? You want to be a comic or you want to be a pussy kid? And next thing you know, we're at a fucking drug house in Longmont, Colorado, at a park buying, like, coke from fucking people who don't speak English and shit. And they were his friends, and the next thing you know, we're driving to Fort Collins, and the next morning I had to get back. He called me at 8 in the morning to drive an hour to, to, an, to a horse track. He was a degenerate horse guy, and I mean, 8 in the morning, he's already doing blow and drinking, popping pills, <laughs> and telling me, kid, if you want to make it in this business, you better take a fucking pill. You know, and I'm like, wow, okay. All that shit is what I wanted to see, like, from Artie and him. Yeah. Like, Artie, because people like that don't really know. I didn't know that the show was basically him being taken out of his Christian base and becoming a comic. Yeah. Now it makes more sense to me. Yeah, that's a big part of it. And that's hard. That's hard. You know, when you have to take somebody away from their basic fundamentals. 
Like I, for me, it was when I, once I read Lenny Bruce, I knew this wasn't going to be a uh, ladies and gentlemen. Lenny Bruce, when he lived at the Chelsea Hotel uh-huh. with heroin. When I read that, I knew what I was getting myself into. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going to prepare myself. But I wanted the viewer at home to know that there's some fucking crazy comics out there. Yeah. That, you know, they did that show on A&E about the dark side of comedy. And they didn't come close. No. They talked to I remember. Them. I remember when I started out, I was a I was an MC. Back then, like, I, I came out of Boston, you know, with Joe, where we didn't go on the road. We had New England. So we went to New Hampshire one night. The next night, we go down to East Providence, Rhode Island. Next night, you're in Maine. And never a hotel. Never a hotel. You drive three, four hours to get to a gig sometimes. They'd give you they'd give you a check that may or may not bounce because it's from out of state. You get back in the car. You drive three or four hours home again. And uh, and I remember um, I finally said, I want to go on the road. I want to go outside of this, uh, see, see if I can do stuff around the country. So I get hooked up with this gig. I drive down, me and Tom Cotter. You know Tom Cotter? Absolutely. We get, we get in his car together, and we, we decide to drive down the East Coast from Boston down to Florida, and we're going to stop in every club on the way, and we're going we're gonna to do five-minute set. We're going to try to get into that club. So we spend like a week and a half, two weeks driving down the coast. And I remember we, we did one room, <clears throat> I think it was Charlotte, North Carolina, and the guy booked a bunch of rooms, the Comedy Zones, right, the comedy out of there. Zone, absolutely. What year is this? This is 91, 92, 93, wow. somewhere around there. So you just got in the car, a la Mitch Hedberg, when he did it with Chart Hogan. Right. Just got in the car. Well, back then there was this book that came out and once a year, and it was called the uh, Comedy something. It was a directory of every yes. comedy club yes. Yes. in the in the country and who booked it and their address. So you'd send your tape out. You'd make your half-inch v- VCR tapes. You'd make, you'd spend all your fucking money making 200 of these tapes. you spend all, all this money mailing them around the country. And then there's no answer machines, so, you know, no email. So you're calling. You're calling these bookers. Meanwhile, you got 500 other comics all call, calling the, the same book from St. Louis. Same directory. And they got a stack of VHSs next to their, next to their desk. That they never saw. So we said, fuck it. Let's cut to the chase. We'll go there. We'll get a five-minute set. We'll be in their face. We'll get some gigs. So sure enough, we get some gigs out of this guy from North Carolina. Ron Denunzio, maybe, was the guy named? So they send me down. My first, my first date is three weeks, and it's going to be Jacksonville, Florida, the Bahamas, and then somewhere else in Florida. I can't remember, but but my job is I got to pick up this degenerate headliner first. I got to take him to Jacksonville, and then this guy had all these marching orders because he lived, he did he did so much coke and did so much gambling that he lived off his t-shirts after the show. He had t-shirts that had nothing to do with his act. It wasn't like a catchphrase from his act, nothing. It was just like, it would just be like a, a T-shirt that said, like, fuck that bitch. And he'd have stacks of them, suitcases full of these. And it was down south. And so all these rednecks would line up after the show. And they'd pull out their cash. And he would just have his pockets stuffed with $20 bills at the end of the night. And then he'd go by blow. And then he'd go to the casino. I remember in the Bahamas, every night, they would send me out. I was the MC, And so I would bring up the feature act. And sure enough, this guy, I'm not going to mention his name because he's still out there. And uh, and and they'd say go find him, and I'd have to go find this guy. And it was on a, it was in in the Bahamas, and they had a casino uh, with with the club. So I'd be running around from fucking the craps tables to the slot machines everywhere, looking for this she's short guy. He was about five foot four, and he wore these glittery blazers, like real cheesy double breasted cruise ship with the black polyester pants with the crease down the front and fancy shoes, shiny fucking. Uh, alligator skin shoes and the hair we, we was like he looked like a magician with that that hair was like feathered back on the sides with the hard part and I, and I'd go looking for this guy and I'd have to drag come on man you're on and fucking five every night that feature act instead of doing 25 this guy was doing 30 35 40 minutes waiting for me to find this guy and drag him back to the show because he was coked up and gambling and he'd come back and he'd do his show and he was a pro but he had this act. You could tell he'd been doing the same act for 20 years, word for word. He just mailed it in. He got up there, hit play, and he was a showman, you know, bigger than life, play to the back of the room, little crowd work, same crowd work every time. Sir, where are you from? Blah. Oh, I didn't know they I didn't know they made blank. And, blah. and then after the show, sell his shit, and then right back to the tables. And on Saturday night, three shows on a Saturday night, all three shows, 
tracking this motherfucker down to trying to get him on stage so that feature I could stop sucking his own dick out there. <laughs> Burning material he didn't have. Stealing by the end. Doing anything to just keep stretching it out until this guy got there. But that was the hardest thing in the beginning was meeting headliners that were worse people than I was at the time. Yeah. Like, here I was a fucking criminal, and these guys... Yeah, but you knew what you wanted to do. These guys had wives, and they were cheating. Yeah, them, right. And just, it was just that. It, it was like two or three years of meeting these type. I'm, in those D rooms, that's what you meet. Right. In those triple rooms and all those other fucking little rooms, you don't meet, you know... Joe Rogan's not going to go in there. Fucking, uh, <laughs> you know, Fitzsimmons is not going to play those rooms. It's a fucking D room, you know? Yeah. You, you work with the bottom of the barrel, and you're like, and they borrow money from you, and they try to borrow money from you to gamble. I mean, it's fucking crazy. So you're thinking, do I even want to fucking do this shit? Yeah. So that's what I thought the Artie character. But the Artie character's been good to him. The Artie character yeah. has been very, very good to which is what you need to do to those guys. You can yeah. tell you don't want to. Like I was watching Training Day the other day, and he makes Ethan Hawke get high in the car. He makes him smoke angel dust. Then he fucks with him and shit. That's evil stuff. Yeah. But that's part of it. That's yeah. part of the fucking thing. You got to, you know, we want you to know. I think for a lot of guests coming in here, I think it's like Training Day. I think you're Denzel Washington, <laughs> and you get people you get people some fucking uh, some gummy bears in them. Some cheaper shoes. No more. That's it. And Listen, two or three hours later, they come, they come walking out of, out into the parking lot like, what the fuck just happened to me? It's, it's so weird how my <laughs> life is that I go through phases and stuff. The edibles I loved because they really got me high and yeah. they calmed me down. But it also came at a price of a fucking bad appetite. And it was doing something to me. And uh, like February, I started getting these. We, first of all, I couldn't eat half the shit anymore. Have to, that, that gummy stuff has to be bad for you. You mean it's too strong? It, uh, or you just mean stuff. the ingredients? One of them that we ate was like on a list, like something that caused cancer. Oh, really? Like yeah. One of the cushy, cushy, things. cushy. So something happened to me at one point that I was like, I got to stop eating. Something was going on, so I had to eliminate stuff from my diet. But you were eating that shit every day, right? I would blast 250 milligrams like at 11 in the morning. <laughs> and be high like for a little while. What's a normal amount? Like twenty? Yeah. yeah. And then come in. <laughs> That's here. a lot for some people. And then we come in here and do two thousand milligrams. <laughs> and let me tell you something. There's podcasts I listen to, and I love you guys. I, I I love that you supported us over the years. But there's podcasts that I would not listen to. Today. <laughs> we were just so fucking hot. You know, somebody posted the Theo Vaughn Mushroom podcast today. Yeah. I listened to that podcast for ten minutes. That was crazy. <laughs> It's like our most popular episode. Wait, you That's guys took crazy. mushrooms and you sat in here and did a podcast? Oh, multiple, multiple times. Multiple times. One really? time we took acid with Ralphie. A couple times, yeah. And one time we took acid with Eddie Bravo and Ari. And Ari took his shirt off and everything. It was fucking great. It was great to do a <laughs> pot. You know, all these things are great, but you got to move on. Yeah. You got to move on. Yeah. And this is in comedy. This is in whatever you do. You evolve. And I find now that the podcasts are a lot more entertaining that we're not doing the fucking edibles. Like, yeah. I don't need the edibles no more. Like I, I, I liked it in the beginning as, as like a catch thing to let people know that we're, we're high and stuff. Now I'd rather get the fucking conversation out of people. Right. You listen to some of those podcasts, and then, and it wasn't us, it was the guests. Some of the guests would get <laughs> blasted, and they'd come in here trying to talk about something, and they'd be lost. The last Wheeler Walker podcast, he was in, he couldn't even talk. Yeah. He couldn't. He was just sitting there with a beard, and then the next day he's like, "You can't put it up now. We're not going to put it up because it was just you know." There's nothing to put up. There's nothing to put up. Yeah. So you evolve in your life. If you don't yeah. evolve in your life, you're going to fucking die anyway. You know. Yeah. I want to switch it up. So you're if not I, doing acid or mushrooms anymore either. And I got everything. I just got a whole new batch of the shrooms. I got liquid acid. I got. Tabs. I got some new window pane that they say is brilliant. And you're not going to use any of it. Well, maybe this weekend in Boston. <laughs> it's Lee's first weekend of MC. Oh, so yeah. I got to introduce No some. shit. It's yeah. going to be great. He's bringing me to a big place. Wow. The, the Wilbur, Wilbur Theater, Fox you're going to have a blast. But I like, can't Wilbur's just. Fun. He's got to pay his dues a little bit. I just can't. Yeah, right. So I'm going to have to make him carry luggage this week and yeah. run to the store and get milk. When that's the wrong milk and smack him. Give him <laughs> that's right. Hand, that's know? right. 
Treat him like an MC a little bit, just so he doesn't make him get this. your Gatorade and your vodka. Sure, and fucking. Um, <laughs> he doesn't even drink. I don't even drink, but that week he'll Give be me a on a fucking Coke. mission. Well, he knows. I already got some formaldehyde. I'm going to yeah. dip a joint in and smoke with him. His mother's coming to the first show on Saturday, so yeah. I'll be good. I'll keep him legit. Yeah. Oh, but after the mother's out of the building, it's all oh, over. Oh, that's right. You're a Boston guy. Yeah, yeah that's going to be great. We're yeah. rolling five joints per show this weekend. We're going deep. Oh, that's great. This that's is how great. To do it. It's uh, like I've had to learn. Like the first time, no, this, it was the second time I did the store. He, I walk in, he gives me 10 edibles, and then he says, oh, yeah, Chappelle's going up and doing 30 in front of you, and lets me sit in that and sweat for, like, 20 minutes, like, 30 minutes, thinking I was going to have to go up after Chappelle. I and had everybody <laughs> tell him that Chappelle's coming in. <laughs> Just sit tight, watch him do it. <laughs> that should be the common yeah, thing. That's it's, great. <laughs> listen, if I tell you I'm putting 400 pounds on the bar and pay to lift it, you're not going to lift it. Mm. You're going to say, I can't do it. It's after you do it that you go, what the fuck was that? And I go, that was three and a quarter. You go, damn. Yeah. You know, the same as with stand-up. When you go, give me a light at 18. Yeah. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah. Fuck him. <laughs> well, I've, been, I've been worried about that. 18, my ass. And you get up there, and you know you've done 18. You've done all your jokes. You're like, he hasn't given me a light. Something's not right. Yeah. And you're like, you're looking at me, and I'm like, uh-huh. Okay. So that's what I'm worried about. Like, what? Like, I, I get, I'm getting nervous. Like, what if I don't see the light and then I just get off, thinking I missed it? And then you're like, "No, I didn't give you the light yet." Go set back. your set your timer about, to vibrate on your phone. What about, Put it in your pocket. Uh, what about when they give you the light and you get off? And I tell you, you should have gotten off. That you didn't get the light because I'll fuck with you. <laughs> yeah. Now I can't pay you. You didn't. You didn't do your. Yeah, time. dude, you I know? had a I had a beef with a comic. Yeah, you won't get paid LA. for that show. This guy, uh, this guy was on. I had I had a show at one club. And then I had another spot at another club, and it was tight. I had to get on and off. And this guy's going on ahead of me. And, and, and he, uh, you know, he's an okay comic, but he's going on and on. He gets the light, gets the light again. And then he's, then he's got the ball sit on the stool and go, what else? Let's see, what else should we talk oh, about? Man. And I'm standing there missing my next set. So I go up to the light, and I just start flicking it. Me, not the manager. I'm flicking it up and down. And he gets all pissed off comes off stage we, we got words we're fucking screaming at each other in front of the whole club <laughs> we're just talking about it the other day i see a light i wrap it up that's oh yeah i i'm res- good for i'm good for one minute after i see respect the light for other comics yeah, that's it is uh huge in my world it always has been right when i see a comic running a light on purpose you're telling me you don't give a fuck about yeah. none of us that you're not part of our army yeah so that's good that I know that now. I know that you're a selfish motherfucker. You know? <laughs> yeah. I see a light. I get the yep. fuck out. I can't wait to see that light. You don't got to light me twice. Yeah. Not at all. No. Nope. Once. One, one time when I was doing Xanax in Beaumont, the light didn't mean nothing. I just laid down and took a nap. <laughs> yeah. And they were lighting me. I can't see the fucking light. You well, go, the problem is, is a lot of times you got comics that are used to headlining on the road. So they're doing, the club owner says, do what you want. Do 45, do an hour and a half. Not an hour and a half, but you know, if you want to do an hour and 15, they're fine with it. And then all of a sudden you're told to do 12 or 15 minutes. Well, you're not headlining tonight. You're doing 12 to 15 minutes. That's it. That's your job. And like you said, there's other people, you're disrespecting everybody else on the show when you don't Guess do that. Guess what? No excuse for me. Right. I don't care if you're used to doing two hours and yeah. don't call the store if you're not going to get off at 18. Right. You're going on the road soon. That's the one thing I like about you. Yeah. That we're a lot alike in the same way. We like to give the road a break. Yeah. It's not our bread and butter. Like, uh, I think the road is a slow killer in a lot of ways. I think it's helpful at times. But then it becomes a time which the law of diminishing returns. So you and I have yeah. families. We like to stay at home. Well, yeah, you want to make sure that when you go out, it's exciting to you, that it's not a burden, that's because then I, you're going to have better shows. Yeah, and I go exactly. out there, I'm in town, I try a bunch of new shit, uh, you just, it's wind sprints. That's what your sets are in town, you're doing wind sprints. And then you go out on the road, and you get to step those bits out a little bit, you get to, you know, feel what it's like to control a crowd for an hour, you know, and, and build it, close strong, all that shit you don't really worry about in town. You know, you work, you work in town, you spend, you could spend three, four, five minutes of your 15 adjusting to the animal that went on ahead of you before you even get into your new shit. And then you got to close with something strong. So that, that leaves you three or four minutes in the middle to try new shit out. Now you go do an hour, you can fuck around, have some fun. The crowd loves it. They love that you're experimenting a little bit. So yeah, I got some day. You want me to read my dates? Yeah. 
All right, shit. I want these guys to go see you. All right, Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, October 4th through the 6th. And then I'm coming out to Niagara Falls, the Canada side, uh, the Comedy Corner, October 11th through 13th. And then Provi- Eats Providence, Rhode Island, October 19 and 20. In and out, Comedy Connection, doing that. And then um, a bunch of other dates after that. San Francisco Punchline in November. Um then How long is this tour for you? Grand Rapids, Michigan, Portland, Oregon, uh, all through the fall. And then Christmas, when do you stop? Uh, I don't stop. I'll be in Nyack, New York, December 28th through the 30th. Oh, And then boy. 31st, I'm up in Portland. You're doing New Year's? Yeah. You are doing New yeah, Year's. I'm not going to leave that money on the table. I don't drink. What do I care? I'm not doing New Year's. Yeah. I'm doing Levity Live December 20th. Yeah, I'm doing that. But Oh, here. so you're, you're coming? Oh, the Levity not Live. Not Nyack. No, right. no. I love that room, by the way. Yeah, Nyack is one room. of my favorite fucking rooms. Great yeah. pizza. Yeah. The pizza place in town is phenomenal. Good people. Chinese food delivers yeah. to the hotel. Fucking yeah. phenomenal. The barbecue spot that yeah. they take you to is phenomenal. Right. I used to go to Nyack as a kid because they'd serve you if you were eight. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. If you're from North Bergen, you're uh-huh. from northern New Jersey, you just got on that 9W. Yeah. And go up to Nyack, they don't give a fuck how old you are. Uh-huh. You're seven, fuck it. That's a Hot Wheel. <laughs> they got a valet for your Hot Wheel. <laughs> Park it over there and shit. Greg, I got to be honest with you. The reason why we have so much fun with it, we're doing your show and my show is the love and respect and admiration Absolutely. I have for you. You're one of the funniest guys in the business. You're loose. There's never any drama, and you're always welcome here. Thanks, brother. I appreciate that. Or whatever, or talk about shit. Yeah. Or talk about enlightening what you did today. That was great. Yeah. You know, I look at my daughter every night. Sometimes I go in there and I dry her off. But I always ask her, anything happened at school today I should know about? Mm. Somebody touched you weird or something like that? Yeah. She's five and she must look at me going, <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? Yeah, like, right. Like, I can't leave the house so she gets out of the shower. Yeah. Because sometimes my wife will come in and go, she wants you to dry her off. Yeah. And put her pajamas on. She wants to talk to you. And I'll go in there while I'm dressing her. I'll never touch her or whatever. I'll, I'll towel her down. Yeah. And I throw her in the towel. I go, dry your little monkey off in your muffler. <laughs> and she'll dry. It's not my monkey, daddy. Whatever it is. Just dry it. All right? What are you bothering me for? I don't want to touch your fucking shit. I don't want to be that fucking dad. All right? Oh. I brush her hair. Who knows? You could be running for Supreme Court justice one yeah, day. Yeah, I brush. You don't want that shit coming night. back. I love yeah. brushing the hair. That's nice. That's nice. I love nice. brushing the hair. Is the best thing in the world. Yeah. You know? It's so weird how I'm happy that I've taken this plan, and I, and half of it I stole from you because you. We spoke about it at the other spot about how important what it was for you to raise your daughter and your son. You know, like to yeah. be a part of their life. You, you look at these kids from comics and they're lost. Yeah. They're lost and their daddy's probably left them a million dollars and that's great. Yeah. But they didn't leave them the thing that these kids really needed. You know, like, I sit there sometimes at karate class with her and I'm like, why am I here? For a fucking hour. And from here we gotta go to the Y and swim for a half hour. Yeah. And you're like, why am I here? And it's because this is it. Yeah. This is what most people give a hand for. If Ralphie could walk out of the grave right now, he would do this. Yeah. He would go fuck the road on a Wednesday. Yeah. I'm going to karate classes. So, so thank you for making right. me a better right. parent. Oh, thanks, man. And making me aware of that. Because I was a little lost when I first met our agent, you know, a mutual agent. Yeah. And, you know, I just went on the road every week. But I realized something was missing. Yeah. And you told me what it was. You have to be a dad and stay at home and fuck the road. It's not yeah. all about the money. If right. I wanted money, I'm gonna, I could have sold Coke. Right. I made millions of dollars, yeah. you know? So thank you for yeah. that aspect Thanks, man. of my life. Man. That's that nice of you to say. Now and, I'm a good dad. And yeah. I'll be in Boston. It's sold out. Here we go. The other one is sold out. But Florida, I'm coming down. And I'm only coming for one fucking week to one place, and that's West Palm Beach. So if you don't get your roller skates and your cape on, you're missing me. West Palm, October 11th to the 13th, and then I'm in Cleveland the 25th to the 27th. I want to thank my man Greg Fitzsimmons for coming on. I, I love that guy with all my heart, all the respect. If you listen to his podcast and the show, you know the guy's the real deal. I want to thank you guys for listening. And number two, I want to thank my family over my bookie. Okay, listen, 
It's betting season. You and I both know it. You took a bath last week with New England. You're fucking losing. Your fantasy, you can't pick a winner. It's all going to change because Uncle Joey's going to direct you to the right place. My bookie is as important as anything else because it's not what you're betting on. It's who you're betting with. That's why I tell you people to go to my bookie. They're the only service I recommend to the church family. That You know why? Because they're good to me. I'm urging you to make your way to my bookie. Again, you win and they pay you. They got in-game live betting over and unders on fantasy po- points scored and the most rewarding player perks in the motherfucking business. Now, my bookie is slammed with new betters all day. So they want to give you everyone the best service possible, especially the church family. So if you're willing to deposit after 7 p.m. Eastern, that's 4 o'clock Pacific, that's 5 o'clock Colorado, and so forth and so on, they'll give you an additional $25 free play on deposits over a yardstick. That's $100. Do you, you understand what I just said to you? So join now, and my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Use promo code CHURCH to activate the offer. Now, you visit my bookie online today. It's my bookie, M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E. And don't forget to use promo code CHURCH. Enter promo code when creating your account, and you claim up to $1,000 in free play. So if you're holding out till after 4 o'clock today or after 7, you get an extra $25 free play on using promo code. And that's a tremendous game tomorrow night. You got the motherfucking Rams playing the Minnesota Vikings on a fucking Thursday night. Who's better than you guys? Right now, if you're willing to hold out those seven, you're going to enter an extra $25 free play by using promo code CHURCH. All right? It's up to you guys. But I'd wait till after dinner to make the extra money. My bookie. You play, you win, you get paid. Speaking of money, you know me, guys. I don't. We're family here. We talk to each other the right way. Robin Hood, I love this. I got the app down on my phone. It's an investment app that lets you buy and sell stocks, EF, ETFSs, options, cryptos. Here's the beauty. All commission free. They strive to make financial services work for everyone, not just the wealthy people, right? Guys like you and me. Values of Robinhood app. Are you ready? Other brokerages, they charge up to $10 for every trade, but Robinhood doesn't charge a commission on fees. It's trade stocks. That means you keep all your profits. It's easy to understand charts with market data. You place a trade, just four taps on your smartphone, and the Robinhood web platform also lets you view stock collections, the most hundred popular sectors like entertainment and social media and curated categories like female CEOs and analyst ratings of buy, hold, and sell of every stock. You learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks and track favorite companies with personalized news feeds. That's custom notifications for price movements, so you know what? You never miss the right move to invest. Who's better than Robinhood? Nobody. So I'm going to do this for you. Robinhood's going to give the church family a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. You sign up at church.robinhood.com. Again, that's church.robinhood.com. And they're going to give you a free stock. Apple, Ford, Sprint, something like that to get the party started. Who else does that for you? Uncle Joey. So I want to thank my bookie. And I want to thank Robin Hood for reaching out to the church family for always hooking us up. I want to thank Greg. I want to thank fucking Daniel and O'Neill. I want to thank Danish and O'Neill, whatever the fucking names are. I want to thank the uh, Christ Killer. But most importantly, I want to thank the uh, church family for listening and for support. Without you guys, we'd have guts. I'll either see you in Boston or October 11th to the 13th in motherfucking West Palm or the 25th of October to the 27th. Free Halloween weekend. Bring the fucking fireworks, acid, bazookas. We're going deep at hilarities. Beside that, I love you motherfuckers. Thank you for burying me and thank you for having my back all the time. Have a great weekend. Stay black, stay healthy, and we'll see you Monday morning, tip-top Magoo. Kick this fucking mule leaf.